to invite uh, Massimo Grimaldi from Bari in Italy, and he will talk about anticoagulation strategies around uh, catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia, because for both uh, ablations we probably need uh, some clear strategy on anticoagulation. So please, Massimo. Thank you, Joseph. And uh, first of all, let me give you three greetings. Happy name day, because it's St. Joseph. Second, happy father day, because in Italy today is Father's Day. And third, I best wishes for the 25th meeting. And this is really a pleasure to stay here, because this is the most amazing meeting I have ever been. Anticoagulation strategies around catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. As you know, this is one of the first registries published about atrial fibrillation complication, and uh, as you know, we can have uh, ischemic uh, complications, and we can also have some uh, um, hemorrhagic bleeding complications. So it's a difficult uh, uh, procedure for electrophysiologists. After the COMPARE study, the first study, comparing uninterrupted strategy versus interrupted strategy, the gold standard all over the world become to do the ablation of atrial fibrillation in an interrupted way. And um, all the studies um, performed after the compare had to compare the uninterrupted warfarin versus uninterrupted new oral anticoagulants. And this is a, a slide it is summarizing the results. The recircuit had very good result, and the, uh, uh, apixaban, uh, the bigatran, this is venture is uh, rivaroxaban and endoxaban were not inferior to warfarin. As you can see, the ischemic event were very, very rare with the, this uninterrupted strategy. Little bit uh, less rare are the major bleeding uh, uh, side effects. In uh, the, the Bigatran study, of course, the bleeding uh, complications were seen in the Bigatran group only but one patient during the procedure. In the warfarin group, they had some more bleeding in uh, the three, four months later. But this is very important because during the procedure we have the maximum risk, of course, of bleeding. And another risk is the risk of uh, minor uh, stroke or silent cerebral events. We have uh, Marco Scaglione that with Gaeta opened this new window on this complication many years ago. And uh, it's scarring to see that uh, with Apixaban or Warfarin we have uh, uh, more than 20% of patients reporting cerebra cerebral lesions after ablation. And also in the Eliminate, in which uh, Joseph was a chairman of the study, we had a lot, a lot of cerebral events. Uh, fortunately, with this study published on circulation, now we know that these uh, acute cerebral events does not impact on uh, cognitive function of our patients. The only impact on uh, cognitive function of our patient is related to the age and to risk factors. So it seems that the acute events does not have importance on the cognitive function. And this is important because um, all the studies on the new catheters uh, since uh, uh, these cerebral uh, asymptomatic events now focus on the ACT level. It is increasing from 300 in the remarkable was 325, and now many studies ask for 350. But do you think is it correct to increase even more this level? I don't think so, because uh, we had uh, in these studies uh, cerebral events also with the ACT, minimum ACT over 360 in some patients. We had, uh, uh, of course, more events when the ACT was lower, but uh, cerebral events during ablation procedure is not only related to the thrombus or uh, uh, small, you see, charring of tissue, blood charring, but 
more frequently are related to the air bubbles. So the management of lung shit, I think, is the most important for these uh, cerebral events. And this is also demonstrated in other studies. But what I want to tell you today is that um, we are moving to single shot catheters. These single shot catheters uh, usually are balloons or basket or something like that. Have uh, the tip very big that completely occluding the lumen of long sheet. The shaft after the tip is much more small. So we create, a, when we push the catheter inside the long sheet, we create a vacuum in the back of the tip. And if you push quickly, this vacuum can be very strong and will take a lot of air from the valve outside the patient. So what I strongly suggest is uh, when you push these kind of catheters, please have a catheter, the sheet, long sheet, connected to a pump and increase the flow rate to 45, 60 milliliters per minute. In this manner, you increase the pressure in the long sheet and it is impossible for the air coming into the long sheet and into the left atrium. Probably with the pulse and field ablation, we will reduce this kind of, of phenomenon, because we will reduce the charring for sure, we will reduce uh, the carbonization of blood for sure, and we will reduce the steam pop phenomenon for sure. We will not reduce the air bubbles. What about, sorry, I don't know why. I have the slide on my computer, I don't have on, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, this is okay, the same. Can we reduce the time of anticoagulation after pulse and field ablation when compared to radio frequency? Probably yes. Not uh, uh, less than one month. We did uh, around we did the 11 peaks um, model with the pulse and field ablation with a circular pulse and field ablation catheter. And this is seven days post-electroporation, and this is one month after. Seven days, we have uh, many inflammation uh, cells. We also have some mineralization. Uh, you see giant cells. And we also had, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't see this slide. In this slide, I showed you some uh, uh, damage to the endothelium, seen at six, seven days. But at 30 days, all the endothelium in all pigs was healed. So probably we can shorten in the future from two months to just one month the length of, our, of anticoagulation in Schatz vasc zero patients, in low-risk patients. Today is two months, as you know, of course. Um, this is a very interesting paper published again from this wonderful group in you know, Czech Republic. And you see, we have um, less complication about PV stenosis, zero, uh, frank nerve uh, palsy. And, uh, but we didn't uh, uh, change the mechanical side effects during procedure. Because pericardial tamponade is always 1%. This is very consistent data in a new oral anticoagulant, in a registry. It's very consistent data. 100% of patients may have a pericardial tamponade. Stroke and TIA are very, very low uh, frequency. Vascular uh, uh, minor or major is a, a complication, but uh, you can uh, uh, abruptly reduce using, by using ultrasound for femoral access. So many centers, in order to reduce the risk of this bleeding and this tamponade, are, they are continuing to do a single skip strategy. The single skip strategy is uh, um, usually used for the uh, twice day neural anticoagulant, uh, much less used for a single day, because when you do the single days, usually you do the procedure in the, in the low uh, plasma level zone. But with Twice a day, you can do the ablation in the peak dose. So, especially in some experience in Japan, they do the single skip, uh, single skip dose of oral anticoagulant. This is a small study, and you see that in these patients, they did a single skip, and they just had one major bleeding event. This is a much, a much larger uh, study Jap from a Japanese uh, uh, you see real-world uh, uh, data, 
and this is a national uh, wide database, very important. And we have <coughs> comparison between 3,282 pe uh, people on warfarin and 3,282 people propensity match the score on NOAC. And 80%, around 80% of these patients in NOAC had a single skip. Or, or non skip when they had um, uh, uh, once day. In Japan, it's very frequent the use of a doxaban, and you have to consider that the, the mean weight is much less than uh, other countries. But you see, the results are uh, very good. There is a, a lack of knowledge today. We don't have any uh, randomized uh, clinical trial comparing the single skip dose with twice against uninter completely uninterrupted. Moving to the um, ventricular tachycardia ablation, one of the most important uh, um, things to uh, underline is the pericardial approach. And this is, is very interesting study from the Stevenson group. And you see there is a pericardial, uh, epicardial ventricular uh, uh, approach without heparin, because in this first group we had just, uh, I can see here, I don't have any more. The, the first group we have, uh, okay. After right arterial ablation, you see we have uh, pericardial cells without heparin. And the second group we have uh, protamine uh, before epicardial approach, because they did before the left ventricle mapping, so we gave, they gave heparin. And third group is, uh, Epicardial approach without protamine. As you can see in the result, there is no difference in the three groups. So it seems uh, uh, possible to do epicardial approach also during uh, uh, heparin. What about the ACT level? In the third group, the ACT level was uh, around 170, as you can see. But the results are good, and not many difference among the three groups. Other uh, labs, like uh, Marcelinski labs, they prefer to do the uh, pericardial approach as first uh, step when they suspect an epicardial origin of ventricular arrhythmia. How they can sus uh, suspect epicardial uh, origin? Looking at the uh, MRI before procedure, you can see this MRI, there is some scar on the epicardial shape of left ventricle, or looking more easily to the ECG. When in ECG, the most negative uh, uh, peripheral lead has a QS uh, uh, pattern, it means that the first, uh, uh, you see here, the first deflection is negative. The most negative in this one is AVL L and D1. You may suspect a pericardial approach. When inferior, you should see, in inferior origin, you should see a AVF lead or more negative lead. And this is the same approach of the uh, Indrix and uh, uh, ARIA group. They do the subxifoid puncture at the beginning of procedure. And this is a very large series of patients. It's uh, 1,287 patients, and they had 20 tamponades, 1.5%. In ventricular arrhythmias, the tamponade is a little bit more frequent when compared to atrial fibrillation ablation. I think it's interesting to see uh, how this epicardial, uh, um, uh, how this tamponade uh, uh, occurs. You see, epicardial was, uh, uh, endocardial procedure were done uh, with um, INR under three when the patients were in warfarin. Epicardial under 1.8 before 2015 and be, uh, below 1.8 after 2015. Patient in OX had a skip of 24 hours. Heparin was given until ACT of 250 or 300. Usually now we are using 300 like atrial fibrillation. And the anticoagulation was resumed on the following day. Uh, Antiplatelet therapy was not discontinued. This is very common all around the world. Let's go to see where the, uh, where the tamponade uh, was provoked. In two patients, transeptal puncture, and one patient had surgery between superior vena cava and pulmonary artery. Four patients during uh, pericardial uh, puncture, all four patients went to surgery. 
one RVOT and one patient with mitral annulus. Mitral annulus is a very risk place, also during ablation. As you can see, 10 patients had uh, uh, tamponade when uh, ablating the posterior inferior or lateral part of uh, mitral uh, annulus. This is a, a very uh, risk place for tamponade. And two of these patients had uh, surgery. One more risk that I want to underline is the steam pop. Because when you have a steam pop, you may have a tamponade immediately or, may, or you may have a late tamponade. This patient was a little bit late, but you may have also a very late, after hours or day. Because you may have an intramural hematoma. This intramural hematoma increases the size slowly and at the end it can broken in the pericardium, you can have a tamponade the day after, a few hours later. So it may be good after a ventricular ablation procedure, if you add uh, a steam pop, do a very careful ultrasound imaging of the left ventricle looking at the walls. Because uh, this is, uh, you can see, if you have a good window, you can see by ultrasound. This is my worst case of my life. This is a very uh, important uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you see here, this, the, he had a VT storm and originating from this area. This area is very thin and probably with a very high pressure because there is a, a, a very high pressure because it is completely occluding the ventricle, this hypertrophic. It was a little bit difficult to reach that area. We did the procedure. We were very happy. We finished the inducibility after procedure no more inducible, I put the catheter away, I was waiting for the ACT time, suddenly the patient collapsed, tamponade. Tamponade, we did, uh, of course, uh, uh, protamine, uh, the tamponade was very quick, very, very quick, we also give 20 uh, units of uh, factor 9, 2 and 10, and uh, we, we went to the surgery. The patient was uh, uh, under surgeon, uh, it closed. This was not at all, it was opened like, like a book. The, uh, the ventricle was, because this part was very thin and very damaged, not only from the ablation, but was very thin, was very soft part of the ventricle. This was opened like a book. But the surgeon did the procedure, but when uh, he was out of anesthesia, the patient presented a stroke, ischemic stroke. And uh, this stroke was uh, uh, with an hemiplegia, unfortunately. And uh, I'm afraid probably um, this factor may play a role in this stroke. So my suggestion is to use uh, the fa coagulation factor only when they are really uh, needed. Usually protamine and weight, it may be useful, but in this case, I can assure you, it was a very difficult case. If um, you have some case with a very quick, uh, very quick tamponade, this may be useful. You may have a male-male connector to put directly the blood from the pericardial space to the femoral, but just for the first minutes, few minutes, because inflammation factors and other factors can um, increase the infl uh, general inflammation of the patient. So after first minutes, you need a cell saver machine that clean your blood, blood thanks to these filters. And this is a very nice, nice document I invite you to see. This is not related to the art, but this is related to the uh, major bleeding after trauma. And it teaches us that uh, in the first moment with a, a huge uh, bleeding, you have inflammation and you have an increase in coagulation in the first minute. But when you have a, an important bleeding, more than one liter, one liter and a half, you have a re reduction in uh, uh, coagulation because you have uh, coagulation factor dilution, you have coagulation factor loss. And this is important, you have coagulation factor consumption. And this is important to take a decision when to restart the anticoagulation. Because if you have a, a great loss of coagulation factor, it's better to wait a little bit more to restart anticoagulation. Because these patients are anticoagulated because they don't have any uh, their own factors. And this is my, um, uh, I'm going to the conclusion. This study is interesting. After VT, what you do? 
aspirin or noax. In this study, uh, Lucky Reddy and the co-workers demonstrated that uh, the use of noax is better than aspirin, especially in reducing the silent cerebral events after VT uh, ablation. The DREAM is um, a drug that uh, uh, prevents ischemic event but not increase the bleeding risk. And I think that this drug is arriving and we started the, uh, the enrollment of patients. And I think this will be a really a good help for our job. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Massimo, for a great uh, overview. And uh, if we have time, we will discuss at the end. So it's my pleasure to invite another Italian, Marco Scalione from Asti, and he will talk about um, uh, how to uh, pacify the patient during the procedure. And you know that he also showed us uh, some time ago hypnosis. So the title is From Hypnosis to General Anesthesia. So Marco, please. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, first of all, let me thank you and also Peter for the invitation. I think it is always an honor and a pleasure to be here, and you create every time an amazing appointment. Let me say that I'm a very lucky man, and I think that uh, I, I've been performing ablation procedures since in, in 1992, and so I followed all the growth of the procedure. And this, I can say, is one of the most impressive innovation that I met in my life, that changed really my life, and not only my personal life, but also in my lab. So my disclosure is that I am a teacher in the uh, Italian uh, School of Experimental and Clinical Hypnosis. And I think that first, uh, first of all, uh, when you have to to face with a procedure every time you have to overcome some obstacles that may be first to choose the right strategy, to choose the right tool, and in this case to manage the terrible four. So what are the terrible four? The terrible four are anxiety, pain produced by the ablation, and the need uh, of immobility. So the patient has to stay still on the bed, and of course X-ray exposure. But leaving apart the X-ray that we will discuss today, uh, tomorrow, I think that now, in order to match what last, uh, you may use constant sedation, deep sedation, and narcosis. And if you take a look to the su this survey, uh, in every lab, I think that uh, uh, every one of us are moving toward the general anesthesia or the deep sedation, while there is a decrease in conscious sedation, uh, regardless of the volume center that you have to, to consider. And if you Take a look to the distribution uh, worldwide, you see that in red are countries performing narcosis, in blue, deep sedation, and you see very few cases of conscious sedation. Unfortunately, in Italy, we belong to the yellow part because, uh, because I, in order to perform narcosis, of course, narcosis has some advantages because the patient is still, no anxiety, no pain, but you need, of course, to use anesthetic drugs you may produce a post-procedural discomfort due to intubation. You lose the interaction with the patient that sometimes may be quite, really important. And above all, you need a complex setting. You need anesthesiologist uh, and the ventilation machine. So this is the problem. And it is not so um, available, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, setting. And what else? We have the solution now. We have the hypnosis. And I think that, first of all, because I'm sure that in your mind, when I'm saying hypnosis, you may think about this, okay? It's not. This is not magic. It's, let me say, it's the thing that is farther to the, to, to the magic as you can imagine. And in this case, you have to use the hypnotic language. So it's based on language. And it's for this that when uh, Peter, asked me uh, four, four years ago to try to hypnotize a Czech uh, guy. It was impossible because I'm, I'm not able to speak Czech. Okay, so I, I succeeded in English. I succeeded in, uh, in performing uh, uh, hypnosis, uh, talking to, uh, to some Englishmen, or in two cases in, with one Spanish and Portuguese because they were able, able to understand English. Okay, 
And this is because the hypnotic language may provide uh, uh, a patterns that may address beliefs, as you may see here, time orientation, perception, and in this case, you may modify the state of mind of the patient. And despite you will see that the patient are having the, the eyes closed, they are not sleeping, and uh, on the contrary, they are really much more in alert and awake and in control than in the normal status, okay? And in fact, if you see this graph, where there is a line dividing the conscious from the unconscious, and you see that the Raza status is here, where the corpuscular and pre sleep is really down, you see that hypnosis is just on the opposite. It's much higher than the Raza status, okay? And it's for this that I am giving the first key message. If you use benzodiazepine, you will lose the hypnosis, because you will uh, cut the control, the mind control of the patient. And you need the completely con mind control of the patient to stay under hypnosis. And we started our experience in, uh, in uh, 2018, and we published it the, the, the year after. And now I'm going to see, to show you just uh, really some seconds of, uh, of an hypnotic status of the patient. And you see here, there's a picture, for example, in AF ablation without any fluoro machine, because I'm able to perform a completely zero fluoro also in this case, if you have a, a patient of the form of Ale. And you will see uh, that the patient is under the bed, just a few seconds when uh, we finish the procedure, putting a stitch uh, because of the uh, a high level of ACT, and then, I will reorientate the patient, and you see that I, I, I will count, and the patient will open the eyes, and in this case, he will tell me uh, how he felt during the experience, okay? The audio, please. I'm putting a stitch, no reaction, no further uh, local anesthesia, okay? It's more or less one hour and a half after the procedure. And put in the stitch, very large, no reaction, because the, the, there is the, the face of the patient here. Is, and, sorry, I, I stopped. Please, the audio. Is okay. Yeah, no, no, but it's the same, but it is with the audio. Okay, if we can exit, then re restart if you want. Okay, this is a noise, but anyway, in a few seconds, I will reorientate the patient. And I apologize to you because in Italian, but I think that you can appreciate also the, the expression of the patient. Okay. I'm, I'm talking to the patient during the procedure. I'm asking how, how was going on. It's telling me well. He was able to feel, but he was relaxed. And he was imagining what was pleasant. And he was riding by him his motorcycle uh, in the country, looking at landscapes. He's looking at landscape. 
piccoli me, mentre passavo nel paese. Uh-huh. Through the countries, ok. E so. mi gustavo il panorama. E lui si sentiva bene, ok? So, we demonstrated a drop in the anxiety score before and during the procedure and if you take a look to the pain score consider that uh, lower than two is considered analgesic in half of them the score was zero and uh, in the other you see was below three and considering two 78 percent as a completely analgesic procedure and you see very few part of them had uh, a very let me say tolerable discomfort and if you take a look to the drugs in the two groups because we compared 70 patients in a traditional approach versus 70 using a protein language at the time and uh, in this group we use only a low dose of fentanyl and paracetamol while on the on, on, in the other group you see propofol midazolam fentanyl and paracetamol and in two cases we needed to perform narcosis to manage the procedure but uh, you may also give a gift to the patient because at the end, during the procedure, at the end, you may teach to the patient to be able to reinduce, so to perform a self-made hypnosis thereafter. And you will see an example of the same patient still on the bed at the end, already reoriented, that, and I will ask him to reinduce by himself, and then I will ask him to choose some parts of the body to be switched off where do not have any sensitivity and I will prick him in the part that he will choose without any reaction. And I give a sign, this is this, you will see, to, to switch on the hypnosis. I am asking to perform the self-hypnosis now, you see. I make him all in my hand, the needle. I'm asking to choose a part of his body to be switched off. He told me la gamba, the leg, which, which leg, so the right one. I'm pricking him. Then I will ask to choose another part. He told me the belly. Okay, no reaction at all. And it, from now, the patient will be able to reinduce by himself whenever he wants. So right now, in these four years, we performed more than 1,900 hypnotic AF procedure, uh, 1,200 more or less AF ablation, the other SVT, VT, and whatever you want, with a success rate that is more than 90%, of course, excluding psychotic disorder, cognitive impairment. And we were the first also to publish the first case of SICD performed just only under hypnosis. In this case, we performed 10 milliliters of uh, lidocaine here and half an ampoule of fentanyl. That's it. And you will see that we tunnel in this part of the thorax without any adjunctive local anesthesia, also along the sternum. And then you will see that I will count up to three, and the number three, the patient will open the eyes, being completely oriented, and you will, you will see what uh, he said, sorry. Okay, no reaction at all. Also along the sternum. Uno, due, Two, tre. three. Eccoci qua, abbiamo finito. Eh? So the patient is smiling. È stato bravissimo. Bravissimo. Dove siamo andati? I asked him how it was, was going on. It's benissimo, it's very well, okay? So you see, he is smiling. And we published uh, in a larger court of uh, patients the same uh, protocol. And you see, this is 
the normal traditional block of the serratus or uh, sedation, and in this case, the hypnotic group. In all the patients in the hypnotic group, the, the score of the pain score was low than two, and on the other, in the traditional group, more than five, okay? So now, this is our casistic right now, pacemaker, ICD, PF closure, also TE, echo, whatever you want. And so, I, I, of course, I think that your mind may arise this question, how is it possible? Oh, this guy is, is over there, of course. Eh? And I, because it's really, it's science. Because with the hypnotic language, you may produce a block, in, uh, a dentrous block, at the level of the dorsal horn or the spinal cord, in a sort, in, in, using the gate control phenomenon, okay? And then you may induce, of course, uh, open or close this uh, path uh, using physical, emotional, cultural, or behavioral factors, in this case also hypnosis. And it has been proven that you may activate different cerebral areas. These are the areas activated during physically induced pain that are different from the hypnotically induced pain or if you imagine pain. And of course, as every methodology, uh, this is operator and patient dependent. And is not the physician having the power, is the patient having the power. So the physician is only able to uh, unlock the potential of the, of the, of the patient. And to do this, uh, you need to create a rapport with the patient, you have to guide the patient. And to do this, uh, of course, you, are, you need to be able to see, to feel, to be in touch, to join with the brain of the patient. And then, now I, I will see with you another example of a young boy, 12 years old, that has to implant a loop recorder and uh, in, in this case, we performed just uh, uh, in three, four milliliter of lidocaine just at the site of incision. And that's it, you will see. I had to push really a lot to insert the device, really. You see, I'm moving the patient without no reaction, okay? It seems to be asleep, but it's not. And you will see then with the next video that uh, counting up to 10, when I will reach number 10, so DHC, he will open the eyes. How was going on? Tutto bene. All is okay. Bravo, bravo. Come ti senti adesso? How do you feel? Bene. Well, normal. Ascolta, sei riuscito a... Okay, so, the trust to continue, I think this is one of the last slides that I will show you. And I think this is really impressive because all these six guys are still on the operative bed. You see the, the coat, the sterile coat, and you will see their faces when I will reorient them. And I think that their faces may give you the right message. Take a look. All of them are smiling. They are still on the bed at the end of the procedure, an ablation procedure, and all of them are smiling. Okay? So, Joseph, this place was the first place in Europe where I presented the experience, then followed the, the ESC, and then the AFIP Symposium, and I put a seed in the ground that is growing up because right now, at least in Italy, we trained 86 healthcare professionals in cardiology, uh, 51 cardiologists, physicians, and 35 nurses all over the, 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 the Italy. You see different regions in Italy, okay? So this is possible. And the training course lasts nine days. Okay, so to be trained to perform hypnosis, you need just last day, nine days. And just the last two messages. So my Angelou said that the people can forget what you said, the people can forget also what we have done, but the people will never forget how you did make them feel. And the, I think this is important. And for the skeptical, the last message, 
All the new truth passes through three stages. The first one is that it is ridiculous. Okay? This is for the skeptical. The second is that it is violently opposed. But third, lastly, it is accepted as being self-evident. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marco, for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, I, I visited him and it's really true. It's not fabricated, really it works. He was in the lab and he saw uh, yeah, I was in the lab and I saw two cases. Anyway, uh, so we have to continue and the uh, last presentation of this session is by Hubert Kochet from Bordeaux. And Hubert is expert in uh, cardiovascular imaging, so obviously he will talk about the role of pre procedural imaging in a catheter ablation. So, Hubert, please. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, in fact, it's going to be in VT ablation. Maybe I got no, theme wrong. Okay. So, it's also ablation. Yeah. <laughs> it's ablation. By the way, we do, we do uh, hypnosis in, uh, in, uh, in imaging for MRI. For MRI in children, it's quite, quite developed, you know, to prevent for uh, undergoing general anesthesia. But of course, it's less painful <laughs> than an ablation procedure. Yeah, yeah, it works very well. And, uh, and actually, the professionals are trained quickly and love that. OK, so the role of imaging in uh, these are my disclosures. So the rationale to use imaging in the context of VT ablation is that we know for now decades how uh, VT, uh, at, le at least scar related uh, uh, VT works. It's related to these surviving fibers that lead to reentrant loops. And imaging is the non-invasive gold standard to image these scars. So we may use this both before and during the procedures. I will follow this plan. Before the procedure, it's very important to understand that a normal echo and a normal angio do not rule out structural heart disease. So this is uh, the, probably the most important aspect of imaging in these patients and uh, uh, with, uh, with sustained ventricular arrhythmias, is that you have to go all the way to CMR if you want to rule out uh, 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 structural heart disease. This is a series from, from our group, but there are multiple series out there that say uh, uh, more or less the same thing. If you perform CMR in patients with sustained ventricular arrhythmias and negative echo and angio, you will uh, find substrate in about 40% of them. And if you compare the, 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 the etiologies before and after CMR, the vast majority of new diagnoses that are introduced by CMR are, uh, oh, you don't see my, uh, yeah, there it is, are non-ischemic uh, uh, substrates. So these are intramural or subepicardial scars that are very often or, or, of, of, of unclear origin, but whose finding dramatically impacts the way you will manage the patient and the risk profile of the patient. But in these patients, the problem is that we are looking at concealed substrates, so small substrates, uh, since the echo is normal. Uh, uh, and, and you may want to use smaller pixels to image these substrates. This is something that we've been demonstrating. When you ask your radi radiology team to do MR, uh, they will perform this late GAD enhanced imaging, which is an imaging that is performed during one breath hold that generates a stack of probably eight to 10 slices on the LV longer axis. Um, and the spatial resolution is not enough to detect small substrates. So you may move to a three-dimensional high-resolution LGE, which is on the bottom left here, um, which works better in detecting these, these substrates. We demonstrated that it improves the spatial resolution by, by a factor of two. Another innovation is to uh, uh, develop novel contrasts. So for now, Two decades, we've been performing late gadolinium enhancement using this gold standard technique. So, uh, after 10 minutes after the injection of gadolinium, we image the 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 the, the, the heart using a T1 weighted imaging technique that 
ideally blackens the normal myocardium to highlight the contrast with the scar, but unfortunately it's, these are bright blood images and there are a lot of ambiguities that remain in the, in the endocardial aspect of these scars and that prevent the robust segmentation, quantification and also detection of small subendocardial scars. So the, the idea is to move away from this contrast to black blood contrast where you also blacken the blood so that you have only the scar. And this is the latest version of this technique that was developed by a, a, a colleague of mine, Aurélien, in Bordeaux, uh, who is uh, combining every other heartbeat, a bright blood image and a black blood image. And the, the idea is that this bright blood image, we know how to segment them with AI. This is the same contrast as the one we use on CNA imaging, and we have been training AI on, on thousands and thousands of annotated data sets to do that. So when you are able to generate images with these two contrasts, you are able to fuse them and to apply the segmentation of one image to the other, providing a fully auto automated quantity quantification and mapping of these scars. We believe that this is the way to make this single click in your lab uh, uh, one day. It is also probably a way to improve a lot the sensitivity and specificity of late guard imaging. For instance, in this case, on the top right image, this is the, the standard technique. Uh, probably I would have uh, uh, described this subendocardial scar on the LV, but on the RV, no way. Huh? So there's also probably a lot of concealed substrates that are not detected due to this uh, contrast issue. So, besides diagnosing the etiology and detecting uh, these uh, arrhythmogenic scars, uh, the use of imaging uh, is important for pre-procedural planning. So, the access route uh, is, uh, can be optimized just by looking at where the scar is. So, if the scar is somatocardial, obviously, a somatocardial or an LV endocardial route, retrograde aortic or transeptal is okay. But when you have these uh, subepicardial scars, such as this one, uh, you may want to go epicardial at the first uh, procedure or to find a CS branch in the, in, the, in, the, in the vicinity because there's no chance you will have any targets from the endocardium and even if you do, you won't, a you won't be able to reach them. And your worst case scenario is this one on the, on the bottom left where you have intramural scars that are equally distant from both sides of the, uh, 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 of the wall where you may want to use imaging to assess where are the most uh, 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 the, the sites where your catheter will be uh, closer to the target. So it may be a cusp, it may be a perforating vein or an artery where you could deliver ethanol or it, can, it, it could be a, a shifting to a different uh, ablation strategy such as bipolar ablation. Another impact of imaging is when you opt for um, epicardial ablation, it's interesting to look at the subxiphoid uh, anatomy. So this is the best case scenario where you have a lot of fat between the liver and the, the xaphoid, but sometimes there are in, uh, uh, structures that may be interposed. And also looking directly at the pericardium to look for potential adhesions. So here it's a case with massive calcifications. There is no chance that you will be able to navigate catheters in this, in this area. So I don't know if you see it. Oh, I don't see my, my yeah. Yeah, there it is. So these massive massive calcification definitely tell you that the, the, the two, two, two pericardial layers are fused and you won't be able to navigate the catheters. And the last thing to check on these preprocedural images is the presence of thrombus. You have to rule out thrombus. Uh, and uh, TTE does a pretty lame job in detecting these apical thrombus. So this is important to perform multi-slice imaging, CT or MR can do the job. Um, and one also important uh, thing is when looking for clots pre-VT uh, ablation, uh, we have to keep in mind that these are not only in the ventricles. Uh, these patients very often have AFib associated to VT or dilated atria, and you also have to check for, for, for the absence of, uh, of clot in the appendage. But the most important impact that imaging can bring to VT ablation is during the procedure, knowing that uh, these extremely lengthy procedures are essentially diagnostic procedures. In fact, the RF duration in these procedures is about half an hour over hours long procedures. So this diagnosis is currently based on electrical measurements that are 
lengthy, sometimes limited. It may be substrate mapping or activation mapping approaches or pace mapping approaches. Uh, there are numerous, uh, numerous strategies. All of them are long and a bit patient dependent. Oh. So the idea is to um, uh, complement this pre -oh. It doesn't work anymore. Yeah, there it is. Is to complement this uh, uh, pre-operative, this intraoperative electrical diagnosis with pre-operative structural diagnosis based on imaging. So to do that, we have to transform these images in a format that is usable in the procedure. That means transforming this into a 3D uh, mesh. So this step is called segmentation. So there's a lot of uh, of software that is being introduced in the in, in the field to segment the data. And if you if you're working with a late gathering Yamenanced MR, you may obviously here also use high res late gathering Yamenanced data to provide a, a, a very detailed uh, uh, architecture of these cars. And in my opinion, there, uh, th there is no other way, or this method outperforms anything that can be done with catheters because obviously catheters stay at, at the surface and cannot see in the depth of the tissue while this uh, is a mapping technique that that uh, is able to, to detect scar uh, uh, with with a, a, a uniform three-dimensional uh, density but the problem is that uh, a lot of these patients have ICDs, so CT techniques to map the substrates have been developed. Uh, CT is less hampered by artifacts. So it, it, on RTL enhanced uh, CT images, you can map the substrate by looking at, at wall thickness, at intramural fat, or calcification, but you can also do late iodine enhanced imaging, at least on the most recent CT systems. It does a pretty good job in mapping the scars. This is particularly helpful in, area, in, in, in the diseases that are not associated with thinning. For instance, non-ischemic diseases with intramural scars can uh, be totally normal uh, on, on, on arterial enhanced images. And the beauty of CT is that you can embed these scars in a detailed anatomy from arterial enhanced CT. This patient also had an MRI and you can check that the, the, the information is quite uh, um, uh, similar. So in the end, what we are generating is not reports anymore or 2D images, but 3D models. And your community, community is getting more and more used to interpret these maps, maps of thickness, of fat, of uh, late iodine or late GAD enhancement to assist the procedures. So the question is how to choose the right modality and there are two steps for that. First, ICD artifact. If, if the patient doesn't have an ICD, obviously CMR is the way to go. If he has an ICD, the artifacts are, are much less of an issue on CT. But then there's another issue is uh, what's, the, what's the underlying disease? Because CT is a great option for infarction or ARVC, because on the, on the conventional arterial and on CT, you will have both the anatomy and a nice description of the, uh, of the substrate. But the problem is for non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathies on the LV, where these intramural scars require the use of late iodine or late GAD enhancement. So it is in this subpopulation where you need to uh, uh, develop specific protocols, either by using wideband techniques to do LGE on MR without artifacts, or by developing late iodine enhanced CT techniques. There's one, uh, one uh, etiology that is using uh, PET as a, a, a technique to, 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 to map the substrate. It's, it's in cardiac sarcoid. Uh, in my experience, it's, it's only in this, in this specific disease that, uh, that cardiac sarcoid can definitely be helpful and bring an additional thing on the table. So the idea of of building these 3D models is to then load them in the in the navigation system to uh, integrate them in the strategy. So there are numerous ways in integrating this into the strategy. It can be helpful to guide pace mapping, to guide substrate mapping, to go to go more directly at the at the at the right spot, uh, not to miss any abnormal tissue, and it's progressively uh, replacing a lot of the substrate mapping that we were we were doing with the catheters, and this has the potential 
potential to uh, uh, speed up a lot these procedures with uh, improved efficacy and, and shorter procedures. This is something that has been... Um, so we are still waiting for randomized controlled validation, of course, but uh, but uh, these uh, meta-analysis and, and the published series clearly show that uh, that it has an impact on, on outcomes after VT ablation. It is now um, part of the recommendation to perform pre-procedural imaging and the guidelines even even uh, uh, mention that it's useful to reduce VT recurrence and, and, and to plan better plan these procedures. So one word on the perspective to, to finish. Uh, the perspective is to not only map the scars, but also identify within the scars uh, areas where critical isthmuses of VT may uh, lie. So it, 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 this approach would skip entirely the mapping uh, phase of the procedure because the targets would be directly defined on imaging. With MRI, it relies on the detection of channels of gray zone within severely dense scar. And on CT, it relies on the detection of channels of relatively preserved thickness within severely thin scar. It works in ischemic patients. So I think Frédéric Sacher will present this, uh, this, uh, this approach uh, uh, tomorrow, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. But you have to, to know that there, there, there's an ongoing randomized controlled trial that is uh, uh, assessing the efficiency of this approach uh, uh, in 16 European centers. So it relies on mapping the thickness in myocardial infarcts and, and uh, designing uh, a preemptive ablation strategy based on, on these uh, thickness channels that uh, traverse the scar uh, uh, within civilly thinned areas. Another perspective is to make use of these images to simulate VT uh, uh, in order, or well, there, there may be multiple applications for that, either to risk stratify the risk for future uh, arrhythmias or to better plan ablation procedures. Uh, here is the latest version of this technique that we have been developing in Bordeaux. It relies on a fully automated process of a CT scan. CT is much more uh, uh, um, prone to fully automated processing. So in less than three minutes, you obtain a whole heart segmentation with the, the tissue character, characteristics uh, mapped in 3D. So the thickness, the fat, and the calcifications. Uh, and then we can launch uh, simulations on, the, on this model. So here you have a uh, pacing on the on the uh, uh, anterior uh, basal part. This is uh, extra stimuli, and then the the the, the VT starts. So the the. the uh, uh, for now, it's still obviously uh, not robustly validated, but I'm confident that within the next 10 years, uh, the young EPs of today will play with these before entering the lab or during their training, or you know, they, they, this will definitely have a uh, uh, play a role uh, in the clinic. Uh, besides simulating the VT, you may also uh, use ECGI technology to non-invasively map the VT. So it makes sense to register these activation maps to uh, uh, structural models uh, derived from CT or MR imaging, knowing that in VT it works in focal VTs, in, in scar-related uh, re-entrant VT, where your mapping is the exit, which may be quite far from the critical isthmus. But we have more and more information non-invasively, and we may make use of this information to uh, design targets for uh, non-invasive uh, uh, ablation therapy. So there has been report on the anti arrhythmic effect of this of this therapy uh, it is not perfect obviously we have uh, been using our segmentation tools to uh, design uh, targets based on imaging and prior EP maps in a series of uh, uh, 70 patients across 14 centers so far we are, we are currently uh, retrieving uh, follow-up data it's not perfect there are late recurrences there are complications we're still struggling to understand which are the best candidates but for sure uh, making use of these three-dimensional models from imaging and uh, prior EP data uh, gives us more control in defining these targets for radiation therapy. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, um, the role of uh, imaging in VT ablation is important before ablation for the diagnosis, for the ablation planning to assess, to rule out thrombus and assess the best approach, uh, and, and for uh, ablation guidance in the lab. It provides an enhanced definition of substrate and anatomy, uh, and it, it allows uh, for a definition of of uh, ablation and mapping targets. And one day uh, it may uh, be leveraged to develop fully non-invasive cardiac ablation strategies. I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Hubert, for again nice uh, overview of the of the topic. Uh, um, just to remind you that tomorrow we will see the procedure by Frederic Sacher, so you will have uh, opportunity to judge how accurate it is. So we we are a bit late, but uh, maybe one question for each speaker. So Massimo Grimaldi, anybody has a urgent question for this gentleman? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, Hubert, you, know, you showed very nice, elegant approach to identify the substrate. Lately, there's been some reports uh, showing that lipomatous metaplasia can be part of integral part of the VT circuits. Can you comment on which is the best imaging strategy to identify uh, fat within the VT circuits? Well, definitely CT. So, for now, what we're doing with CT is half a millimeter cubic voxel and with that we find fat in about two-thirds of, of, of the infarcts that enter a VT lab. This is on our experience, uh, mostly in old infarcts. And yes, it, uh, it seems to relate to both the, where we see the VT circuits and also to our ability to ablate them. So uh, we've, been, uh, we've been studying that. The, the patients with the fat uh, are more prone to recurrences. We don't know whether it's because fat makes it more pro-atmogenic or because fat protects you know, uh, um, myocyte bundles from ablation. But it's definitely CT and the next generation of CT system, the photon counting CT, will increase a lot more the, 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 the spatial resolution so we will see much more fat with smaller pixels. So that was not Massimo Grimaldi, obviously, but anyway. So a any question for Massimo? Anticoagulation, just reminding, if you forget what he was talking about. <laughs> yeah, Massimo, uh, great talk. What do you recommend uh, when you do a pericardial, epicardial approach and it's a clean stick, but after ablation it becomes bloody, especially if you've been in the endocardium as well? Um, we like to give steroids and, and long-acting uh, liposomal bupivacaine in those cases, but if there's ongoing blood, I'm always reluctant to pull out and, and, and not leave anything. And I know that we need to monitor the patient for ongoing bleeding. So do you have any, any kind of guidance as to how to manage the pericardial puncture that becomes bloody during the ablation? Yes, this may, of course. Thank you for the, que for the question. This may happen. And uh, usually we prefer to give uh, uh, some colchicine uh, in order to prevent inflammation and also we give uh, uh, antibiotics to prevent infections. Uh, the, the problem is that if this bleeding continues, you, you should suspect some um, small artery puncture. Because sometimes when this bleeding do doesn't stop, it is some very small branch of coronary artery and in this series, a couple of patients needed the surgery to this, uh, to this trouble because uh, you can uh, break some small branches of uh, coronary and you may have this trouble. If it is only an inflammation trouble with colchicine, uh, it works. Uh, we don't use steroid in order to avoid uh, an excessive block of platelets because steroid acts also on, pla on uh, platelet. Thank you for the question. We had a case also that I tore a little bit of right ventricle because the patient had adhesions after previous surgery. Some people recommended that you can do uh, lysis of adhesions by catheter. You can, but you can tear also right ventricle. It was bleeding only a little, but uh, continuously. So the patient went uh, for surgery because of uh, incessant VTs, which we could not get because there were adhesions, and they, they repaired this uh, so it could be from any any area. It could be punctured artery. It could be uh, from the puncture from the channel. We also had some bleeding from the channel uh, to the heart. So it's it. okay. So uh, question four. <laughs> I said one yeah. question for so one, but okay. Yeah, sorry, Joseph. One very quick question. Massimo, what duration of anticoagulation do you propose after VT ablation? Three, six, 12 months? The set of anticoagulation for VT ablation. We use a 300 uh, ACT time with the heparin and uh, always. 
And uh, if they are on antiplatelet therapy, we don't stop because 80% of these patients, 70-80% are ischemic patients, so they take antiplatelet for uh, ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. And that's all. If they are on uh, or not, please tell me. The DOAC, the DOAC, okay. They start in the study of Andre Natale, they started the uh, uh, anticoagulant, uh, if I remember well, uh, 12 hours after ablation. So the day after, the day after they started oral anticoagulant. We, we usually start now the same day in the evening. With, uh, oral See, they start, uh, no. usually they finish in the afternoon, the, the, the morning after the procedure. And for how long? How long? How long? Along, uh, in the study, it, it was uh, the follow-up was one month. But uh, usually, I think if you want to do the, the exact the same of atrial fibrillation, I suggest two months, mm -hmm. because you need two months for completely healing, repair, uh, healing of the endocardium. Because the the trouble is the damage of the endocardium, and with radiofrequency. In an animal model, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of studies. We need two months to have a complete healing of the endocardium. Probably with PFA, we will be able to shorten to one month because the endocardium is much less damaged by the PFA. We also use for two months, uh, two months. even more. Two months. I mean, when the patient comes for the first visit after, which is usually two months. So question for uh, Marco. Hypnosis. So I hypnotize them. You hypnotize them. Oh, Bill. How long does it take you to, um, what is the pre-procedure time required to get the patient in the right state? I, I, I expect to... this question <laughs> because, of course, it's normal. Uh, you have two choices. Uh, you may, as, a, as we usually are in habit to do, you may hypnotize the patient directly on the bed, on the operative bed. So I, I enter the room, I start uh, just having a relation with, uh, talking with the patient, and uh, the induction protocol, so I mean since zero up to, to have the patient completely uh, hypnotized, more or less five minutes. You may have also faster technique if you want, I don't like it, because uh, uh, I think that it's much better to, uh, to join with the patient and to, to use a sort of smooth okay, protocol. But anyway, it's five minutes. An important issue is that if you want, if you can, I think, if in, it's a matter of time, you may also hypnotize the patient the day before in the world Yes, because you may teach the patient to perform by himself uh, a, a self-made hypnosis. In this case, I hypnotize the patient and I use a double sign. One is just on, uh, on his own, for example, just joining these two fingers. And another one is my sign. For example, I use to put the, my hand in this way on the, on the head and I will say to the patient that every time he will want, but also every time that I will use this sign on, he, on him, on depending on his will, of course, is always following his will, I can induce the, the patient. In this case, uh, when, when the patient will be in the, in the operative room, to induce the patient will take more or less two seconds. At any way, this any also this the five minutes that you may spend in the in the lab will be uh, earned during the procedure because the patient is completely still. I mean still. I mean no movement, any finger, completely still on the bed for two hours, three hours, whatever you want. Okay, and uh, I think this this lead uh, to toward a very uh, smooth uh, procedure. Okay. Really, last question, but you're making me Th really. Th thank you for the convenience. Uh, uh, Mark, I'd like to ask just one short question. Is it possible to hypnotize during PFA as well? <laughs> this, this was the question of Peter, because before Peter Nezil uh, 
<laughs> told me that uh, this would be the question that uh, he, he had uh, in mind. Uh, I, of course, yes. Uh, the only real question is if the level of pain may be managed by the uh, hypnosis. I, th I think so, and I, uh, my, my answer is yes. But uh, the level of uh, um, pain control is depending on the patient. So when you hypnotize a patient, uh, everyone, uh, you produce an analgesic status. The level of the analgesic status is different patient by patient and depending on the patient characteristics. 20% of patients are completely analgesic. So I mean that you can cut an arm without any anesthesia, but only 20%. The other 80% uh, have a, a different level of analgesic property. And I think that, for example, in AF ablation, uh, once the patient is under hypnosis, in, in our experience, in four years, uh, we had always a complete control of the pain, using a, a, the maximum maybe one ampoule and a half of fentanyl for the entire procedure. And so I, I will try to answer also publishing the data about PFA very soon. Okay, well, thank you very much. So we are moving to next session, and it's my pleasure to introduce, and I, I probably, I don't need to introduce uh, Bill Stevenson to anybody who is interested in VT ablation, because he's one of the gurus uh, of VT ablation. As you know, he described uh, this uh, reentrant circuit, how, um, how you can uh, identify different components of the reentrant circuit by pacing. And uh, Bill will give us uh, such a kind of overview of history of VT mapping and ablation. And there is no more, uh, uh, I would say, qualified person for this than Bill. So it's my pleasure to, to have him here. Well, thank you very much. Is this, is this on? You hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Joseph. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And congratulations on the 25th session of this wonderful uh, Congress. So, um, so VT ablation really started with uh, the pioneering work of um, Guy Fontaine and Gerard Giardone with a surgical ablation for ventricular tachycardia. And um, from that, Mark Josephson pioneered catheter mapping and really in a series of remarkable papers in the late 70s and early 80s to find a lot of the terminology that we use in the way that we tend to now think of uh, catheter mapping for uh, ventricular arrhythmias. And this, uh, his mapping really focused on identifying the exit region around the scar. And then the surgeon, of course, took out a very large area of scar. So when DC catheter ablation came along, um, uh, invented by uh, Dr. Scheinman and uh, Dr. Gallagher at uh, Duke. This was the first um, uh, catheter ablation procedure, and it was going to target a relatively focal area. The first person to do DC shock ablation for VT was actually Jeffrey Hartzler, who was an interventional cardiologist who was uh, one of the pioneers of um, uh, percutaneous cardiovascular intervention. Um, and uh, his first patient to do DC shock ablation was actually an idiopathic RV outflow tract VT. Probably the last patient any of us would want to put a catheter in, the, in and hook up to a defibrillator and deliver a shock with the attendant barotrauma that can be produced. But the patient did well and the field was uh, launched. So then the question was, well, we've got this method to uh, target a focal region of ablation. Can focal ablation interrupt VT? And there was animal work done by El Sharif and Lawrence Gessman that showed that in an animal model with large reentry circuits post infarct, that there were critical sites where you could freeze and interrupt uh, reentry. 
How do you find those? And we come back to Dr. Josephson and his uh, catheter mapping uh, work. And uh, he had observed that at some sites, you saw almost continuous electrical activity. And the thought was, well, if you have continuous electrical activity, maybe you're recording from the entire reentry uh, re -entry circuit. But uh, Pedro Brugada, who at that time was in Hein Wellens' laboratory in Maastricht, had observed that at some sites where you had that continuous electrical activity, it would come and go. And others had shown that you can have continuous electrical activity due to uh, electrical artifact. So uh, the question that we had as I was coming out of my uh, cardiology fellowship and getting into this uh, area, I was interested in working on this problem. Um, and um, there was a paper that was published by Doug Zipes and Eric Prostowski in which uh, they raised the possibility that with catheters, you could exploit this phenomena called inhibition, that if you put in a stimulus during the refractory period, it could extend refractoriness. And we thought, well, maybe we could use this to identify critical sites in reentry circuits. So in our first DC shock catheter ablation patient, we, um, you, we attempted to do that. We put in scanning single extra stimuli, and we actually saw this. So here's ventricular tachycardia, there's a stimulus, and it terminates tachycardia. So we thought we had found it, but we recognized that anything can happen once in the EP lab. So we tried to reproduce it, and when we repeated program stimulation, we induced a different tachycardia in this patient. We could never find another site that did this, uh, that did this again. Um, and we now recognize, of course, that what this is is not extending refractoriness. It's really that you're capturing and uh, inducing a, a wavefront that propagates out towards the exit of the circuit but blocks before it gets there. And then in the antidromic direction, it collides with returning waves. And uh, Hassan Garan in an animal model and Frank Bogan have shown uh, uh, that that usually indicates that you're in the, uh, in the reentry circuit isthmus. So in our second VT ablation patient, we did the same thing and we saw nothing. We didn't recognize that anything had happened during the procedure. But in going through the tracings uh, later that night, I was looking for evidence that maybe we'd slowed tachycardia and hadn't recognized it. And we hadn't slowed it, but what we saw was resetting the tachycardia without changing the QRS morphology. And we recognized that what we were doing was really single beat entrainment of tachycardia. And Al Waldo had described the criteria for uh, entrainment. And then when we got to our third case, we were primed. So we knew what we were looking for. We did scanning single stimuli. We did trains of stimuli. And in that patient, we were able to find um, a site where we entrained the tachycardia with concealed fusion. And uh, Fred Moratti had made the same observations independently around the same time. So uh, the entrainment mapping was, uh, was launched. And then we <coughs> applying <coughs> or extending from the work observed um, by uh, Debacher and Hauer in explanted hearts that you can have these geometrically complex reentry circuits um, and intramural components of the reentry circuit, we thought that we could exploit these pacing maneuvers to identify critical sites of the, um, of the reentry circuit when you couldn't map the entire circuit. And this uh, idea was further extended by Eugene Downer in Toronto, this idea of complex reentry circuits three-dimensional in their um, uh, geometry and with uh, large sheets of activation connected by critical um, segments of reentry circuits. Well, we didn't have any way to validate any of this mapping stuff with DC shock ablation because when you give a DC shock, everything terminates. But when radio frequency ablation came along, pioneered by Sean Wang, at the University of Arizona, and then first applied it for uh, ventricular tachycardia ablation by Michael Davis and Martin Borgreff and Gunther Breithart um, in, uh, in the late 19, uh, 1980s. Now we had a way to try and validate mapping um, data 
for it because when you turned on the RF and you were at a, at a critical spot in the reentry circuit, you would expect the VT to terminate. So we had kind of worked out what we thought should happen with pacing maneuvers in computer simulations and in people who are having DC shock ablation, and we were then able to test that in a series of patients who were undergoing radio frequency catheter ablation, and that allowed us to validate some of the entrainment maneuvers that we still continue to, uh, to use. But uh, that doesn't address some of the other important mapping challenges for VT, particularly with SCAR-related VT having multiple morphologies of VT, limited mapping time that you can spend in VT because the VT is often hemodynamically poorly tolerated. So we need an, a, a different approach. And that approach has evolved into what we now are commonly uh, refer to as substrate mapping. The first time I can find substrate mapping used in the literature was this uh, article from uh, Helmut Klein and uh, Al Waldo, using it to, with the thought um, that identification of the electrophysiologic substrate of ventricular arrhythmias could be found with mapping, and they were using this during uh, surgical uh, ablation. And of course, uh, uh, John Miller and Dave Callens and Mark Josephson extended that to the use of catheter mapping in the electrophysiology laboratory. But they observed that you often saw abnormal electrograms over raw, wide areas. It usually didn't direct you to a particular site, a critical site for, uh, for reentry. And we observed the same kind of thing correlating uh, findings of pace mapping and uh, abnormal sinus rhythm electrograms to critical sites of reentry circuits defined by entrainment. That you often saw abnormal areas over a very broad uh, area, and it didn't seem like it would be helpful for directing ablation to an individual site. Then came a major technological advance that really was a, a game changer, and that was the development of electroanatomic mapping systems. And Shlomo Benheim developed the first system that uh, achieved commercial uh, success and developed into the CARTO system. Uh, Graydon Beatty developed a system that evolved into the uh, Abbott um, uh, Insight system. And these enabled one to um, define and better relate the anatomy to the electrophysiology. And then uh, Frank Marchlinski and Dave Callens in a, really a landmark paper um, defined voltage mapping. And this criteria of the 1.5 millivolts being very specific for areas of um, scar where myocardium had been replaced by fibrosis. And this number has held up very well with standard ablation catheters and large tip catheters. And a number of groups have uh, validated that, that relationship between voltage and scar. And there's elegant work that you all are familiar with from Katja Zeppenfeld and, uh, and the group in Leiden, uh, correlating this in, through, in a variety of uh, diseases. Um, and uh, uh, also clarifying that that 1.5 millivolt threshold um, is very specific for fibrosis, but that very often there, you can have fibrosis that extends underneath areas of uh, surviving myocardium on the endocardium, which uh, exceeds that 1.5 millivolt uh, threshold. So it's not uh, very, uh, uh, very specific. That has led to a substrate type of uh, ablation approach, and one can take the approach of painting the low voltage area red, as was uh, reported by uh, Luigi Di Biasi and Andrea Natale, or a more refined approach of trying to identify critical channels within the scar that's been uh, uh, elegantly uh, demonstrated by a number of investigators. Pierre J coining the term lava, local abnormal ventricular activity. Um, uh, Antonio Baruzzo with scar dechanneling and uh, others um, evoked delayed potentials and uh, identifying hidden substrate and hidden slow conduction uh, electrograms. And all of these are targeting these regions of um, surviving myocyte bundles that can be uh, dissociated from some of the surrounding myocardium. And this is typical of uh, areas of reentry circuit channels. You can also identify these with pace mapping demonstrated by uh, Professor De Chaloux and others. Um, and we also recognize 
that uh, with this substrate mapping sort of approach that you see a lot of electrograms that are far field signals. That, um, by which I mean they're generated by depolarization of tissue at some distance from the recording site. And uh, there are ways of trying to identify those with pacing maneuvers and with the uh, further advances in development of high density mapping systems where uh, and all of these systems now have algorithms that attempt to do a better job of recognizing the local potential versus the far field potential, often by considering the adjacent activation of, uh, of points. The development of these high density mapping systems allowed further refinements in substrate mapping, and Elad Anter um, came up with the concept of reentry vulnerable zones, areas of slow conduction and abnormal conduction that can be identified um, by uh, pacing during sinus, during sinus rhythm or changing the activation sequence during pacing, and showed that targeting these areas was often effective for uh, uh, re-entry. A very similar approach was shown by Rod Tung as well. Um, well, this, um, and this is Rod Tung's work um, with the uh, high density substrate mapping to identify areas of deceleration zones, areas of isochronal clustering, a uh, characteristic of slow conduction. Well, um, now they, they, um, although substrate mapping has been um, uh, widely adopted and is pretty effective, it is still useful to be able to identify a critical reentry circuit, particularly if you have a um, known clinical VT or a VT that originates in a high risk area, such as adjacent to the conduction system or in the epicardium adjacent to the phrenic nerve. And the mapping systems have become so quick um, that it's often uh, now possible to define complete activation over a ventricular surface for, uh, for many VTs. And Paolo de la, de la Bella's group just recently um, reported that if you identify a complete reentry circuit, uh, that circuit is likely going to be gone after ablation. Uh, that that predicts um, a lower rate of recurrence. So there's still a role for mapping in VT and defining critical uh, reentry circuits. But the problem is, uh, back to the work of doctors Debacher and Downer, that the circuits are often three-dimensional, and in many people, components of the reentry circuit are deep to the endocardium, so that you um, cannot reconstruct the entire circuit with activation mapping. That brings us to the imaging, and you just heard a wonderful uh, imaging talk, um, and it's uh, quite likely that this is going to revolutionize again our approach to these scar-related reentrant uh, tachycardias as this field is moving uh, very quickly, and uh, a few more advances in the uh, definition of uh, substrate can be, uh, can be expected as a result of that work. So that's all on the mapping side. I'm going to leave out the huge progress that happened with the ablation tools, which is summarized on this slide. Over the last 20 years, we went from solid tip 4 millimeter electrodes to large tip electrodes to adding temperature sensing to adding internal irrigation and external irrigation and force sensing. And hopefully, all of that work done by many of the people that you see on this slide is uh, hopefully going to be replaced in the next few years with some other advances in uh, technology, some of which we'll hear about at this meeting. So here is our timeline. We started in the 1980s with VT ablation. In the VT ablation registry, the procedure mortality with DC shock ablation was 4.5%. The procedure, intra-procedure mortality now with VT ablation is almost zero. It's very, very low. Um, and we've gone from single center observational studies and advances to now multi-center randomized trials in the world of VT ablation. But still, if you look at the recurrence rates in, uh, with VT ablation, they're still in the 20 to 30 to 40 percent range for SCAR-related reentrant VT. So there's still uh, a lot of room for progress, and uh, this meeting's like uh, uh, the 25, 25th symposium here uh, provide us uh, an insight into what we're going to be seeing in the future that I'm sure is going to further improve our outcomes for VT ablation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, for this nice overview. And we, we will make uh, some small change because uh, uh, we will have live cases, and uh, I will take uh, Miguel 
uh, to ICAM and uh, other guys are already in Homolka, so they will have talk from Homolka. So we will have now talk of Miguel uh, Valderabano on alcohol ablation, whether it will have chance to survive pulse field ablation. And then I will leave with Miguel and Bill will uh, finish this session, chairing this session and uh, uh, all other cases will be done at distance or pre-recorded. So, Mr. Valderbano. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I don't see my slides. Let me see. Maybe swap this. Okay. Swap this, place. Got it. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here in the 25th uh, Prague Rhythm um, course. Um, and it is my 10th anniversary here. The first time I came here was 2013. So I'm really happy that this is going and growing. And I'm humbled to follow uh, Dr. Stevenson. And following his talk, my stuff is going to feel kind of pedestrian, but this is the way it is. So I've been tasked with the, I, with the task of uh, discussing the role of venous ethanol in, in ventricular arrhythmias and to, ask the, to answer the question as to whether it would, it would uh, uh, hold a fight against PFA. So my, um, my answer to the question is yes, I think it will hold a fight. Um, I will discuss the role of alcohol ablation in two specific uh, contexts of ventricular arrhythmias. One is LV summit ventricular arrhythmias and the second is uh, alcohol for ablation of large VT substrates. So starting with LV summit, the challenges of LV summit are ablation are really uh, several of them. Number one, it's a very complex anatomy and very complex fluoroscopy to deal with. Number two, when it comes to the veins, we not until recently, we did not have a clear idea of the venous anatomy of the LV summit. And there tend to be multiple vein candidates. And these are best visualized uh, when you have obviously a 3D renditions of, uh, of a CT, it's easy. Like in this one, you can see the LV summit veins. But in fluoroscopy, it becomes harder because you see a two-dimensional shadow of your venograms. And uh, I just want to make a clear point, a uh, clear take-home message that if you use the LAO caudal view, you open up uh, the uh, transition from great cardiac vein to the anterior interventricular vein. And in that projection, it's very easy to see all the LV summit veins, which include an LV annular vein that goes towards the aortomitral continuity, a septal vein at the corner of the great cardiac vein with anterior interventricular vein, or there's more distal septal vein that may have branches between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and some diagonal branches. When it comes to delivering alcohol, we also need to be cognizant of the extensive collateral um, uh, circulation that exists between uh, coronary veins. The collaterals are both epicardial, as shown here, which would be um, uh, pre-capillary collaterals, and you don't want to, uh, you want those to be uh, closed because the alcohol will shunt from one vein to another, and then there are post-capillary collaterals. So let me just show you how this is done in, a, in, a, in an easy way. Following this uh, scheme of the anatomy, what we do is we select a um, LAO extreme caudal projection that opens up this transition from gray cardiac vein to anterior interventricular vein, and then we sequentially map septal veins. The septal veins will be will be uh, displayed as veins that go uh, leftward in the screen, um, rightward anatomically to the anterior interventricular vein. And here I have a microelectrode catheter in a distal vein where I get a signal that is 30 milliseconds before the QRS. If I map uh, a more proximal vein, I get a signal that is 46 milliseconds before QRS. This is way uh, earlier, greater precocity that we're used to uh, when we map endocardial surfaces, but keep in mind we're mapping directly in the intramyocardial. And the way this is done in general, we do um, a 3D map, uh, activation map of the RV and the LV outflow tract and the anterior interventricular vein. Uh, typically in LV summit uh, arrhythmias, the earliest signals will be in the corner between great cardiac vein and anterior interventricular vein, as shown here. We look at the veins, we map them sequentially, and then we deliver alcohol. In most cases, not all of them, when we select a vein to deliver alcohol, uh, we inject contrast first and we will see intramyocardial staining. Uh, 
which means that the alcohol would go directly to the myocardium. This is one such example. We started mapping uh, the subaortic LVL flow track with a catheter uh, folded um, over itself, mapping the subaortic LV outflow tract. Um, where we had a good pace map. You can see the ablation catheter tip in this intracardiac echo still picture uh, showing just underneath the aorta, um, as shown here. And then we mapped uh, the great cardiac vein and we put a microelectrode catheter in that corner. We had delivered radio frequency in the subaortic uh, area, just to be, to be thorough. And when we identify, when we look at the fluoroscopy and we identify the intramural vein where we have the, intram the intramural microelectrode catheter, we have a signal again, 39 milliseconds before the QRS. And we, 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 when we inject contrast, you see there's some collateral flow, but there is myocardial staining. So in situations like this, what we do is deliver alcohol. And what you will see is an immediate increase in echogenicity in the area that's being ablated. Here I have side by side. Uh, the location of the ablation catheter tip when we deliver radio frequency endocardially, and next to it, the area of echogenicity that develops after giving alcohol. You can see how it's directly intramyocardial to where we had been ablating uh, in the subendocardium with the, with the ablation catheter. We can, on cartosound, select these echogenic areas and incorporate them into the map. And what you will see is this beautiful colocalization of the echogenic area post-alcohol with the areas where we had been ablating uh, subendocardially showing that we really are delivering an intramyocardial ablation. And when you get an MRI in the first 48 hours, you will see this phenomenon of microvascular occlusion, which is the opposite of delayed enhancement, it's hypo enhancements. The, the capillaries are blown up, gadolinium does not get there, and it, look, and it looks dark. Uh, some cases are not like this one where we have staining in the first injection, and some cases require advanced technique to deliver alcohol into the myocardium. And we published a series of such uh, kind of advanced techniques uh, to, de to deal with more complex anatomy. I will go quickly over some of them. This is one example of the, pro the, the technique of double balloon approach to limit distal flow. So this is a case where similarly we had, we had mapped the LV outflow tract and we had mapped the anterior interventricular vein and we had an octopolar catheter in the first septal branch of the corner between the great cardiac vein and anterior interventricular vein. Our signal was best 39 milliseconds before the QRS, not in the distal electrode but in the electrodes 2, 3. So we did not want to necessarily target with alcohol the more distal aspect of the septal vein. When we look at the venogram of the septal vein, you see how it's a large septal vein in the LAO coral view. And in the RAO view, you see how the septal vein continues and has a long branch inside the septum, but we do not want to target. The multipolar electrocatheter was in that vein. And the best signal was in two or three, so we did not want to go beyond this area. So what we did is we put two balloons, one for a blockade of, of flow, and uh, the balloon number two, the distal one, and the proximal balloon to deliver ethanol in that restricted portion of the intramural vein. So this is the way it looks. And when you do an MRI, in this case, we did not have a post MRI within 48 hours. This, this is a one month MRI. You see the localized area of delayed enhancement, consistent with a regional uh, localized scar area. There are times where uh, you need to use the double balloon to block collateral flow. And this is one such example. This is a patient <coughs> that um, had a large left ventricular annular vein, uh, but the best signal was actually recorded from a septal branch of the great cardiac vein AIV junction. So there was a septal branch that kind of took off from here and communicated, as you can see here, uh, with the annular branch. So giving alcohol here would have simply simply shunted the alcohol back to the great to the coronary sinus and not delivered a, an intramural ablation. So what we did in this scenario is we put a second wire in the annular vein have a first wire in this first septal, we put a balloon in the annular vein to block collateral flow, and then deliver ethanol to the balloon in the first septal. You can see now we get staining regionally in the area that we targeted without shunting back to the coronary sinus. Sometimes we've used um, a crossfire approach with multi-vein ethanol in injection in patients that had um, more than one vein where we had good signals. So again, this is a baseline venogram, annular vein, and then septal. 
and we actually put two uh, microelectro catheters in, in these respective veins, first in the annular vein and then in the, in the first septal. And when we um, first injected contrast uh, through a balloon in the first septal, we saw similar to the previous case, shunting back. Uh, so what we did is we put a second balloon and delivered alcohol through both. Um, this allowed the creation of an echogenic area that was uh, positioned in the, in the area that we were targeted. These are the signals that we, we recorded from both uh, intramural um, multi-electrode catheters. And this is the uh, microvascular occlusion obtained uh, within 48 hours of MRI. Sometimes the collateral uh, circulation gives us opportunities to deal with uh, complex anatomy. This is one example where there was a large annular vein, very big, and then followed by a first septal more distally. The, the best signal was recorded very proximal in this annular vein. And my colleague actually delivered radio frequency in this area uh, without an effect, thankfully without uh, any damage to the coronary arteries. Uh, but they, we still had to deal with um, how to tackle uh, delivering alcohol in this large septal vein and trying to restrict it to the very proximal aspect. These are the signals that we recorded from the microelectrode catheter in this uh, annular vein. 38 milliseconds before the QRS, good pace, ma pace map. And what we did, kind of by chance, um, was we advanced a wire that went from uh, the first septal backwards through collateral towards the annular. So these arrows indicate the direction of the wire. The balloon is here, the balloon lumen, lumen is facing the coronary sinus. And what we did is we then inserted a, of course we paced from the wire, we got a perfect, perfect pace map. Then we put a bigger balloon in the coronary sinus blocking the flow and delivered alcohol. We delivered alcohol through the balloon that was in the septal vein into the annular vein backwards, restricting the, um, the staining and the alcohol to that area and achieving therapeutic success. Sometimes uh, we've had to deal with situations where uh, we could not use two balloons for technical reasons or for reasons of availability. Um, and we use this approach of venous sclerosis of large veins with prolonged ethanol dwell time, uh, giving the alcohol for a long time. So this is one example where the patient had uh, a large diagonal vein, the AAV was big, and this uh, septal one was, was where we had the best signal right at the, at the corner between great cardiac vein and anterior interventricular vein. Again, my colleague delivered radio frequency thinking that it would take care of it, it didn't, and what it caused is occlusion of the AAV. So this is a stump of the anterior interventricular vein after radio frequency was delivered. This is a problem that can happen when you deliver RF in, in, in coronary veins. The veins shut down. So now we had to deal with the, the problem of delivering alcohol into this first septal without an AIV, which was fine. We were able to cannulate it with a wire. But when we injected contrast, there were extensive collaterals going back. And I could not put two balloons. It was too small. So what we did is we injected the alcohol. Um, alcohol had been used to treat varicose veins in the past. There's plenty of literature for that. We let the alcohol sit there to two cc's, we let it sit there for 15 minutes. And when we shot contrast uh, after the, the prolonged dwell time, we do no longer had this collateral flow and the staining was regional, was, was localized to this area and we achieved success. And in case to a very similar example, baseline venogram, two, two septal veins, very big AIV. They delivered radio frequency and now they caused a big stump of the AIV. And when we injected contrast in the septal, look at the massive collateral flow that had developed after the AIV occlusion. So again, to prevent uh, alcohol from just simply going from one vein to another and we, to force the alcohol to stay regionally in that area, what we did is we did the prolonged dwell time. And after that, um, the uh, injection led to local staining and no longer collateral flow. So this can be helpful in some cases. Uh, we uh, did a systematic study of uh, quantifying uh, to the extent that we could with ICE and you're looking at the echogenic area and with MRI looking at the enhancement on, on 30 day MRI to look at the extent of a scar after LV summit ethanol infusion. You can see it, these are 10 examples of baseline and after alcohol uh, echogenicity. You can see discrete areas of echogenicity develop uh, in the areas that we were targeting. 
and we can outline it on CARTO and calculate the volume. And on delayed MRIs, so 30 days or more, um, these are the echogenic areas, sorry, the, the delayed enhancement areas segmented in 3D models to compute the, the, the size of the volume of uh, alcohol-induced scar. Overall, a median of, uh, of uh, four cc's um, calculated by both um, MRI and, and uh, ICE. Um, and what we did also define is the long-term progression of the scar. These are examples of the mic microvascular occlusion uh, shown in one day post-alcohol uh, ablation, 44 days and 122 days, how this area progressively becomes conventional scar, like you would see with any other kind of scar processing and a, and a delayed enhancement area. So from microvascular occlusion to delayed enhancement uh, chronically. These are uh, more, and more and more and more examples. The problem with this is that most of these uh, cases had received concomitant or previous RF ablation. So we do have a couple of examples of, of um, alcohol-only ablation. Let me see if I can show this slide because I have it um, hidden. Yes, so alcohol, these are two examples of alcohol-only and the same phenomenon was shown uh, where uh, we had one day post-alcohol microvascular occlusion and 41 days uh, delayed enhancement. So it's not something that's specific um, to, that it, it's not specific to ablation, but clearly in the absence of radio frequency, we get the same phenomenon, microvascular occlusion followed by delayed enhancement. So these are the available evidence that we have collected over the past few years on the role of venous ethanol for LV summit arrhythmias. We've delineated the venous anatomy of the LV summit, uh, in the importance of the LAO caudal projection, the importance of mapping multiple veins, the role of collateral flow, uh, large veins, and suboptimal transient response, and the techniques to deal with those, including dial balloon, crossfire, prolonged ethanol dwell time for venous sclerosis. And we have delineated the real time increased echogenicity on ice and the long term. Um, characteristics of the alcohol-induced scar on MRI. Overall success has been 76% at one year of follow-up in all of these were ablation fa failures. So none of these were the novel cases. All of them had, had a failed radio frequency. So this is the available evidence for alcohol in LV Summit. What is the available evidence for pulse field ablation in LV Summit? This is it. So we'll, st we'll move on to um, venous ethanol substrate ablation. The, the, idea is based on the same principle. We know that alcohol delivers ablation. The idea is we need how to deliver it to large substrates. And the concept is illustrated in this, in this figure where you have a scar that has its venous return and you can use the veins along the epicardial aspect of that scar to deliver alcohol most of the time using a restricted alcohol delivery using double balloons, blocking distal flow with one balloon while delivering ethanol in the proximal balloon. And using, as shown here, sometimes multiple, multiple veins. We recently compiled a series of 44 patients. The idea was first to do the standard of care, which is mapping endocardially and, if possible, uh, epicardially, and deliver radio frequency as needed. And when radio frequency failed, we, did, we would perform coronary sinus cannulation and venograms, find veins in the substrate of, of VT, map them, uh, and then deliver alcohol using the double balloon approach. So let me show you examples. This is a case of uh, a previous uh, infarct due to a large right coronary artery um, infarction, leading to an inferoceptal scar that extended to the uh, inferolateral basal uh, LV, and two VTs were induced, one consistent with a more lateral exit and one consistent with a more septal exit. What we did after delivering extensive radio frequency was to map the veins and superimpose the veins, uh, the vein anatomy onto the endocardial map. This is the posterior branch, this is a middle cardiac vein, and this is the coronary sinus. We see that the scar is between the middle cardiac vein and the posterior vein. These are the signals that we mapped, uh, putting a microelectrode catheter in the posterior vein, late um, potentials on pace rhythm, and during VT mid-diastolic signals. So clearly, this, the, the segment of this vein from here to here you could consider it as being part of the circuit, or part of this, the, the, uh, the substrate. So this is how the way it looks on a venogram. And the challenging part was that the, the vein in the scar is from here to here. And there are two large branches, this study, that we did not want to deliver alcohol into. So what we did is we put one balloon in each of those two branches, balloons two and three, and balloon one was used to deliver alcohol proximal to those. And we did it sequentially from distal to proximal, 
moving the proximal balloon um, towards, more, towards the ostium of that vein in different steps uh, so, that we would, sorry, so that we would deliver alcohol along the vein that was in the segment of the scar. This eliminated the lateral VT, but the proximal VT was still going on, sorry. And what we did then is we cannulated the middle cardiac vein and with two balloons we delivered alcohol from distal to proximal using the same approach. You can see these septal perforators going up and alcohol would be delivered uh, sequentially from distal to proximal into the septum. You would see an uh, echogenic area de level de developed on the septal aspect as well as an echogenic area de uh, developed in the more inferolateral aspect. When you sound those areas and you incorporate it into the map, this is what you see. The double asterisk is the inferolateral scar delivered, um, achieved with alcohol injection in the posterolateral vein. And the single asterisk is the more septal scar achieved with the middle cardiac vein. This led to a complete, uh, a more, I mean, led to success in eliminating induction of the tachycardia. We've done this in LAD infarcts as well. This is another example. We mapped epi and endocardially this, this VT that appeared to be coming from an apical uh, infarct. The patient had um, not only LAD disease, but also circumflex disease, a posterolateral, a lateral uh, scar. Everything was ablated to the extent that it could be ablated. Uh, there was no capture pacing the endocardium. We ablated epicardially as well. Uh, this is the inside out epicardial map. And the patient still had VT induced. Um, so what we did is we mapped the veins that uh, kind of collected venous return from the apex, apex. And three veins actually got there. The middle cardiac vein had a branch, uh, the anterior interventricular vein, and a lateral vein uh, served venous return um, to this scar. So what we did is sequentially deliver alcohol in each of these. So this is the lateral vein, um, which the distal part was in the scar. We put a, a balloon in the lateral vein and deliver alcohol through this. Then we go into the middle cardiac vein, deliver alcohol in the more distal aspect. And then finally, in the anterior ventricular vein, which was kind of sclerosed, as you can see here, uh, we managed to get the balloon there and deliver alcohol. And this actually is the one that actually took care of business. The, 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 um, causing this new area of echogenicity in the apex and eventual success. Um, so. It's, it's, it is a labor-intensive procedure, and you may need to tackle more than one. Uh, this is an example in a circumflex infarct. I want, uh, the process is very similar, basically different veins in the substrate were ablated, including a lateral vein and then a middle cardiac vein, and sometimes a, a smaller veins that appear when you, when you take uh, multiple venograms. It also works, uh, let me just skip this, it also works for um, non-ischemic substrates. Um, this is one example of sarcoidosis, a patient with two previous ablations that had failed. We mapped the endocardium, the patient had a large uh, anterolateral or anterior, yeah, anterior, basal anterolateral scar. We, set, we obtained 3D matrix with the, in the anterior ventricular, interventricular vein with a decapolar catheter, so we know the location of this vein. We ablated endocardially, nothing was achieved. We then mapped the epicardium, and there was corresponding scar in the same location. We mapped the, the propagation of tachycardia in the endocardium. It appeared to be, we don't have a complete reentrant circuit. The vein seems to be completing some of the circuit. You get an idea there may be some incomplete reentry because we're not mapping stuff that could be connecting from here back to here. So what we did is, okay, if we had a vein along this area, on the, on the scar, it would be nice. So we perform a venogram. We had the decapolar catheter in the anterior interventricular vein, which was here. And sure enough, there's a nice diagonal branch. So what we did next is put a multipolar catheter in that diagonal branch, as you can see here. And we superimposed it in the 3D map, and you can see this octopolar catheter in the diagonal vein is right on top of the scar, endocardially and epicardially. So then we look at the signals. In the diagonal vein, we had mid, beautiful mid-diastolic signals, very robust, much larger in amplitude than what we had mapped simply in the epicardium. By pacing, we confirmed that entrainment maneuvers uh, supported the idea that this was in the reentrant circuit with uh, short post-pacing intervals. And then we delivered alcohol sequentially by putting two balloons in this diagonal vein from distal to proximal, delivering alcohol from the proximal balloon and blocking the distal flow in the distal balloon. And in several stages, we deliver alcohol sequentially to achieve myocardial staining 
we were able to put the octopolar catheter back in the vein and show the elimination of the local signals. And, and by ICE, we had new echogenicity that when we incorporated into the map, it matched the location of the targeted areas. Sometimes the anatomy uh, is tough and it, allows, it, it doesn't allow to you to complete the double balloon approach. This is one such example, another patient with sarcoidosis and previous ablation failures, extensive epicardial scar, not so much endocardial, but you can see here the location of the anterior interventricular vein and the great cardiac vein. We were able to put two, I mean, the, the octopolar catheter in the AIV as well as in the diagonal vein. By activation mapping, it appeared to be focal. Um, and then we basically defined that we kind of wanted to deliver ablation therapy through the diagonal vein. And we obtained venograms, and sure, there's a nice diagonal vein, but notice the presence of this big posterior lateral vein that fills with collaterals. We mapped the diagonal, sorry, we mapped the diagonal vein with an octopolar catheter. Pa pace map was decent, not quite perfect. We put one balloon, we were, we were not able to put two balloons in this diagonal vein because the balloon would not go, um, just because of the tortuosity and the complexity. Uh, but what we did notice is, you know, we could, um, cap we could capitalize on this collateral flow. So following on techniques that uh, Seth Worley has, de has developed for left ventricular lead delivery, we put a, another sheath in this posterolateral vein, a balloon and a wire going through this posterolateral vein through collaterals into the target diagonal vein. We put a second balloon in the anterior interventricular vein, and then when we then deliver contrast, you could see how we could deliver contrast through this balloon, achieving localized uh, staining of the myocardium and no more flow into the anterior inter interventricular vein. And after delivering alcohol, you get this more myocardial staining. We deliver alcohol, we achieve a nice ablation, and the goal was achieved of uh, controlling the tachycardia. So these are examples of how this was done. And similar to what we had done on LV Summit, uh, MR can, can illustrate some of the mechanisms of how this works. And these are, again, most of these cases have had previous ablation and complex MRIs to interpret, and many of them have ICDs. So the MRI data is not that great, but this is a case that had um, a circumflex infarct with some subendocardial uh, delayed enhancement and patient underwent extensive ablation with RF plus uh, alcohol ablation in coronary veins. We had the microvascular occlusion in the first day after the procedure in different slices here from base to apex. And um, on five months post ablation, most of the areas have become conventional scars by gadolinium enhancement. In a case of non-ischemic VT, um, similar story, a pre-existing pre basal lateral scar. After alcohol, you get this uh, microvascular occlusion that on one month follow-up MRI becomes, not completely some residual, uh, but becomes largely a uh, delayed enhanced uh, conventional scar. Uh, over the course of the experience of 44 patients, we, uh, we showed that uh, freedom from VT recurrence was 73% uh, at one year. And you could think that most of these failures are actually due to substrate progression rather than, pro than procedure failures. The number of VT episodes dramatically decreased, not everyone, of course, and the complexity of anti therapy was significantly de um, decreased. Uh, we don't have any such clinical data for PFA in, human, in humans with VT, although the experimental data appear promising. So we, we concluded on this, on this experience that um, intraprocedural substrate ablation by venous ethanol exceeds that ab afforded by conventional ablation, both endo and epi, and this led to a reduction on um, VT episodes, simplification of the uh, anterior therapy, and with the caveat that multi-vein, multi-balloon strategies may be required to achieve a thorough uh, substrate ablation. This is now the content of a NIH-funded VELVET trial, which will be starting hopefully soon. So to answer the question that uh, Joseph posed me, will venous ethanol have a chance against PFA? Venous ethanol has several pros. It's a reliable bailout approach. The technology required is simple. It's angioplasty balloons that are available already, and it's cheap. FDA approved alcohol in 1946. So really, there's not much to, <laughs> to it. Uh, and, but it does have also mechanistic opportunity with venous mapping, venous cannulation, um, perhaps understanding, understanding more of the mechanisms of, of VT by getting signals from the veins. 
Uh, the cost of venous ablation is that it's technically de demanding and PFA promises to be very simple. So far, we don't have uh, a lot of reproducibility proven on this technology. We have no randomized data, although it may come back uh, after, the, after the velvet trial is completed. And it requires additional uh, skill set um, that is, we don't have, most of us, that we have to kind of grow and learn as we, as we em embrace this technique. And it has zero industry support, so no careers will be catapulted with this. And there's no commercial hype with it. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Val Durbano is going to be running <laughs> to the EP lab to show us uh, for one of the live cases. So our next speaker, um, I believe, is Elad Enter. Right? No, it's me. We've had a little schedule switch. No, it's uh, not Elad. No, no. Me. They will be. They will be. Is it Furman? With us to oh, to great. Okay. So our next speaker then is Furman Garcia. Um, who will talk to us about intramyocardial mapping of ventricular premature depolarizations via septal venous perforators. Furman. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we, we see you and we hear you. Perfect. Um, um, and you see my slides or you see me? You see me, but there you are. Okay, perfect. Now we see your slides. Um, I'm going to try to, to do a follow-up to uh, Miguel's talk, essentially, because we're going to be talking about similar things but different approaches. And um, in a way, uh, it's how we got here. So the area that we are discussing here and Miguel was discussing is the top of the left ventricle, which Schiff very nicely um, described this morning. And what we need to do when we're talking about this area is we need to understand all the kind of neighbors around uh, the top of the left ventricle. Uh, traditionally speaking, the LV summit is a term that was acquainted by McAlpine as the highest point of the epicardial surface of the left ventricle. So that's all LV summit is. It's this yellow arrow right here. Now you can see that as you go more septal, you are on top, directly opposite to the septal leaflet of the right coronary, the pulmonary artery. You are in front of the right left junction, and epicardially, you will be below the left main, the LAD, and the fat pad of the artery. So this is why epicardial ablation doesn't doesn't really work for this. Now, what you can also see is there is some septal arterial perforators, and because the veins tend, in some cases, to follow the arteries, you get some venous septal perforators in the whole muscle. The problem is that they're completely random and unpredictable compared to that. So if you were to map this area, you have to think on the epi somehow. You can approach it from the top of the left ventricle and the left coronary cusp. You can approach it from below the left coronary cusp in the left ventricular outflow tract. Or you can use the venous branches and uh, and the potentially the arterial branches, the first, the first experience for this, I think Chief and his team described uh, mapping the arterial branches of the LAD for this, for this region. You can never forget the pulmonary artery and the septal pulmonary cause because as a vantage point for ablation and potentially bipolar, right here you're opposite to the LV summit and you can see it in multiple different views. And, uh, and uh, finally, in this beautiful transillumination, uh, you can see the left coronary cusp, but right in between, you have this window, this window being the right left junction. And the right left junction puts you right opposite from the endocardial aspect of this region on the LV summit. So you have kind of six points of attack uh, for this. I'm going to concentrate on number four, which is the, the Venus mapping on how to approach this. So what we normally do, and uh, we get access into the uh, coronary sinus and then access into the gray cardiac vein and then access as high as we can with a steerable sheath. And then the idea of the steerable sheath is that it's big enough that you can, you can fit more than one catheter for mapping and eventually you can change for an ablation. And you have to do a good venogram. I normally just put the wire that comes with the vein and then you just do a good venogram uh, by injecting pure contrast um, and uh, not really uh, diluting it. You can also do 
a balloon injection. Uh, but what you're looking for is a definition of branches. This is the AIV in the gray cardiac vein. So if you put something here, you're going to be mapping the epicardium. And then here you have the, um, the venous perforators, first, second, etc. Depends how they come. And the idea then is to somehow map the veins. Uh, you have to, in most cases, selectively cannulate them. And I prefer to use glycath from Terumo because they're friendly with the veins. The JR4s and all the other catheters are really designed for arteries. And sometimes they are a little rough on the veins. And but what happens is you can dissect it and you lose the opportunity to map it. Nothing bad happens, but you lose your opportunity. And here is a selective venogram of one of the septal perforators. And you can clearly see how that vein goes down the septum. It's a huge vein with a huge territory. And that has to be taken into consideration when you're going to do any strategy here for, for anything else. In terms of mapping, what we have been using, we started with a wire. You can use any wire connected in a unipolar way. And then we've been using lately the um, uh, this Japanese company distributed in the US by Bayless. It's a uh, octopolar uh, two French catheter called the EP star. And then give you the ability to place. You cannot place this catheter on its own. You need to selectively cannulate. And the whole idea of this is for anything that looks outflow track that is not typical RVOT. I don't even spend time trying to memorize algorithms. This is not typical RVOT because the transition is too early and it's inferior access. So you call this an LVLT PVC or presume LV summit PVC, however you want to call it. You do your venogram and then you find the veins you want to map. You map the epi by putting it on the AIV and the gray cardiac vein, and then you find the branches that could be of interest. And what you're looking for is to see what's happening. Now, one interesting observation that I will bring up is that frequently I have seen in this region areas of lay potential and fractionation. So even though these patients, most of them have idiopathic PVCs. You could argue if there is something very small happening in this muscle, because in most instances you will see these EMs are not normal. And then you're looking for the patterns of activation during the PVC. So you can look at sinus and you can look your PVC. And then, of course, it could be early inside, deep on the septum. It could be early subepicardium, or you can basically find things like this that bracket this. And then you can transform this and any sort of activation mapping or to get an idea. I'm going to describe what I think is a practical approach to this, and we've been talking about this for a while. Um, essentially, you start with LV summit, presume problem, and then you map the endo, the epi, and the septal branches very fast. With this information, you're going to try to look at the patterns of activation. The easy pattern of activation that I will not spend any much than two seconds on it is if you find something that's early in the end. Though, this is something that you would say, I don't need any of what you're saying, Fermin, because I go to the end and I find it's early. And this is, again, the pattern of activation when you put the epicatheter. This is the map in the AIV. It's late. You can see here the wire, in this case, was a unipolar wire. It's earlier than the epi. But truly, when you put your ablation catheter opposite to this, you have to think this as a unit. You're mapping the epi. You're mapping the intramural space. You're mapping the endocardium. And here you find that's early in the endo. You're blading the endo, and the problem is eliminated. The second, the second, uh, the second group of patients is, uh, I, I'm hearing someone talk, I hope you guys are not. Uh, the second group of patients are the patients that are um, um, early in the, in the epi. This is what Miguel probably was talking about when he talks about LV summit. This is what we call LV summit. This is something that's early in the epicardium. And this, of course, if you get something in the AIV that's minus 45 milliseconds, then you're at true LV summit. And that's where you have to do some techniques to figure this out. This is a classic example in which ablation catheter placed in the AIV to map the veins here was earlier uh, in the epi than in the endo. And uh, usually your pace maps are terrible in the uh, end up, but they're pretty good on the epi because you're very close to the source of origin of the arrhythmia. And usually you're limited by the coronaries and the fat. Um, and you, we came up with this strategy that since 2000 and 
early 2010 or so, we look at the distance between these two catheters. And it's very simple. If you're close enough to something, you can ablate from the end though, and you may reach it. So if that distance is, I would say, one centimeter, you may get lucky. So this is a classic activation pattern of a subepicardial um, uh, uh, origin in which is early. You can see the catheter that is set up in the first septal perforator. It's proximal to distal. That means the subepicardial is coming down to the intramural space. And we put the catheter opposite to the early side. In this case, it's EP star 8, not 1, because 1 is late, 1 would be here, and you can see how late we are in the endocardium. The ablation is super, super late. However, when you look at intracardiac echo, it's very useful. You have a good catheter position right here at the base of the left ventricle, and you can even see the EP star on ice. And then you're doing a lesion, and that lesion seems to be pretty good. And the PVC goes away, but it tends to come back. Now, when it comes back, if it comes back, you have to look at the morphology. You can see here the morphology change. It become more right bundle and wider. So in that case, we have to redirect our attention. In this case, we use the technique on putting the ablation catheter in the AIV. And in that case, you see an early signal here. And if that distance is less than one centimeter, from the vein to the end, though, and you're far from the coronaries, it doesn't matter what technology you use, you're always going to see this little ditch because your catheter is going into that first septal branch. It just cannot advance because it's too small. And then from there, you solve the problem. The third pattern is a very interesting pattern. And I think this is where I would defer that everything is alcohol. Because it's true for the true LV summit, alcohol might work much better than anything else. But in this pattern, I, I think that we still have a very good chance of ablation. That is the pattern in which the intramural space is earlier than anything else. So in this example, we have a patient with a PVC. And you can see here that 3-4 is the earliest activation. And when you do the activation or the propagation, on this case, the earliest is intraseptal. From the intraseptal goes to the epi and then goes to the endo. So if you put the ablation catheter simply fluoroscopically opposite to the earliest side, so three, four in this area, you put the ablation catheter here, the signal you would get from the endocardium is extremely, extremely late. You would not normally ablate there. But just simply because you're opposite anatomically to the side of earliest activation, and you put your ablation catheter there, now the distance, you can see here beautifully, the tip of the EP star is right inside of the septum right here. The distance from the endo to that is 0 0.5 millimeters. So what happens is you're so close to the earliest side of intramural activation that if you do a lesion, even being late, your proximity is so close. You can see here from the earliest side on the vein to the endocardium, your proximity is so close that a lesion in the endo is going to reach easily the mid portion of that intramural space and the PVC is going to go away. So I think that not everything is epicardial and we fail because we were not doing necessarily the best work at mapping, so I think the key for success is better mapping. And you have to come with a strategy based on the pattern of activation. And my strategy is that if it's early in the end, though, you are late in the end, though, because that's n n very, very logic. If it's early in the intramural space, from the intramural to the epi or from the intramural to the end, you found a true intramural site, then you put the catheter opposite to the earliest site in that intramural space. And because the distance is going to be way less than half a millimeter, an endocardial lesion is going to ablate, and you don't need anything else, and the case is done. However, if you're subepicardial, that's where you're going to have to get to your toolbox and decide if the distance is less than one centimeter, you might try ablating the endo to reach the epi. But truly, here's where you're going to have to either consider ablation in the AIV and the gray cardiac vein if you can overcome the anatomical limitations and or the impedance and or think on what was mentioned earlier today, bipolar ablation, or these are the cases that I think alcohol is going to be 
another very useful technique. And in rare cases, which we have no patients refer for this in the group from Chicago, uh, they, when Rod was in, in there, they did some thoracoscopic uh, surgical procedure to get to below the LED, but I think that alcohol uh, will take away the place of any potential surgical ablation. I thank you very much for the opportunity once again to speak to you, and um, I appreciate um, the chance to be here. Um, and I pass the computer, I think, now to a lad who is going to come to do the second talk. We're doing the questions after, right? Yes. Yes, we'll do questions after. I hope you could hear the applause. Yeah. So our next speaker, our next speaker then is uh, Elad Antwi. All right. So this is what I want to do. Um, hi, everyone. Oh, Can Furman, you see I me? think you're still live. Can we switch the audio to uh, Professor Antwi, please, from Tel Aviv University? Okay, I think you can see me, right? Yes, we can see you and we see your slides. And you can hear me too, right? Yes. Okay, so I was tasked with speaking about will pulse field ablation change the results of catheter ablation for VT? We can make it a short, uh, short talk and we can say no now or that we can go through the slides. What do you prefer, Bill? <laughs> Let's go through the slides. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, let's review the potential advantages of, of PFA for VT. So obviously there are safety advantages that actually um, fueled all this uh, PFA. No esophageal damage, but it's not really of uh, major significance for, uh, for VT ablation. There is no or just transient phrenic nerve injury, which can be an advantage. Safer around coronary arteries, that was the initial promise um, is it really safe around coronary arteries? So let's see this um, paper from Vivek and Peter that um, looked on the Farapulse catheter for doing um, PVI and CTI. For PVI, it was absolutely safe. For CTI, when you systematically do right coron coronary artery and geography, I think in 100% of the cases, they saw severe narrowing even without ST elevations and without clinical manifestations, but you saw this uh, diffuse narrowing. Um, when you gave, one second, sorry. Could you stop this place because you are showing. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So how do I do this? Let's see. How do I swap it? One second, guys. You can see the slides, right? We see swap your presenter place. view at the moment. Now we see the slide. Okay, I'm sorry. Can, you can see the slides now, right? Yes, we see the slide. Okay, okay, so I'm sorry. I'll just go back one slide because I'm not sure where you lost me. So we said that from the safety standpoint, um, the uh, safety around the esophagus is less meaningful for VT ablation. The safety around the phrenic nerve is, uh, is important. And we spoke about is, it really, is PFA really safer around coronary arteries? And um, I showed um, this slide from, um, from uh, Vivek and uh, Peter's study that showed that when you do CTI, so basically when you apply PFA very close to a coronary artery, in this case it's the RCA or the PDA, um, you cause, in 100% of the cases, you cause diffuse narrowing of the blood vessel, uh, potentially from spasm because when you pre-treat uh, um, um, the coronary arteries um, or systemic, systemat systemically with nitroglycerin, you can, um, you can prevent this injury from happening. And the conclusion from this paper was that PFA very close to the um, coronary artery can cause acute severe coronary spasm, but that can be uh, relieved with prophylactic nitroglycerin. But this is an interesting study that came from Ed Gerstenfeld group, where in swine, they ablated really on the coronary arteries, epicardially, and they survived the animals. And what they saw there, yes, there was moderate to severe acute coronary spasm, but also there were chronic findings in the coronary arteries um, in, uh, in the sense of mild stenosis and neo hyperplasia. And it replicates what we saw with the different technology in our animal lab. 
um, a week after ablation, uh, there was uh, neo-intimal uh, hyperplasia. So I do think that that's a real phenomena. So it's not just um, a vasospasm, there is actually actual injury to the blood vessel. Um, as far as efficacy advantages, um, so one of the promises of uh, PFA is that it allows to make faster applications and potentially faster procedures. Um, let's, uh, let's see if it's really true or not. So I want to share with you um, some of our data. When we looked with the Sphere 9 catheter on the effect of repetitive um, applications in the same location. And what we saw is that when you apply four applications, one after the other, but we wait 10 seconds between, applica between applications, you get um, deeper lesions and a higher likelihood of transmorality. Um, you can see that um, when you apply four applications versus one application, the lesions are deeper. The volume of the lesion is, um, is, um, is bigger. But let's see what it takes. So four applications, five seconds per application. We have 10 seconds um, time interval between applications. Now the 10 seconds, I don't know if the 10 seconds is accurate, that's what we've done. When we waited five seconds between applications, we did not see the benefit of repetitive um, applications. So it looks like you really need to, to, to have a, a longer inter-application um, interval. Is it 10 seconds or maybe it's it eight, it eight seconds, but it's still a significant amount of time. So if you do four, applica four applications or five seconds and you wait 10 seconds between the application, so in each site you're going to spend 50 seconds. Now, um, Ed Gerstenfeld published um, um, data with the Farpol catheter when they did also four applications, 2.5 seconds between applications, also 10 seconds between applications. So that, that takes you to 40 seconds. So for each location, 40 seconds. We don't have data yet with, uh, with the PFA from a focal catheter, but I think that it's going to be longer duration than the other two because you apply less energy because of the higher current density from a small uh, tipped electrode. So application duration, at least currently with, uh, with the first um, evolution of PFA, is not, is not a big advantage over RFA. But what is really an advantage is the, is the, the effect of, um, of PFA in SCAR. And I want to share um, this, uh, this study that we did. We, uh, in, in swine, we uh, induced LAD um, occlusion for three hours, survived the animals for um, eight to, uh, eight, uh, six to eight weeks, and um, had an anterior wall infarction. Now, in half of the animals, we did the ablation with the Sphere 9 catheter using um, a PFA. And in the other um, set of animals that had the same um, MI, we ablated the border zone with, um, with STSF. So it's not, it's not an exact uh, comparison because you compare a large foot uh, uh, electrode catheter with a 3.5, but that's what we um, were able to do back then. And um, um, so we, the setting we used for the PFA were, were what we found that gives us the maximal lesion um, depth, which was the four applications, 10 seconds between applications. With STSF, we used 30 watts, contact force of 10 to 20 grams, and an AI of 700 to 800 um, um, units. Now, you can ask me, why did you use 30 watts um, and not more? And I want to share this with you because it's important. This is under review. But what we did, we did a study um, that um, came, uh, asked the question, you know, what is the, first, like, is AI, as a formula, is it valid for ventricular ablation? And what is the target AI value to get the maximal lesion dimension? And what we found is that in healthy tissue, healthy ventricles, an AI of 700, you can push it to 800, but overall 700 gave, gave us the, the deepest lesion. Beyond this, there was no growth of lesion. But importantly, what we found is that when you achieve this AI value with different parameters, you get different lesions. So when you apply, uh, when you do, when you, you get an AI value of 700 with 30 watts, you get a a bigger lesion than you would get if you reach this AI value with 40 watts. Now, you'll ask why. 
The reason is that it's the proportional significance of time and power in the formula, and I'll show you the formula in a second. But when you apply 30 watts, you, the, the ablation duration to reach 700, or the goal AI that you have, is much longer. And when you make deep lesions, likely the duration plays a significant role. Similarly, similarly, when you apply 25 grams of force versus 15 grams of force, guess what? The lesions are going to be bigger with 15 grams and not 25 grams. And I think that, again, this is because of the formula that gives less proportional significance to time than it gives to contact force or to, um, or to power. So what works in the atrium may not work in the ventricle. Um, but to the results, when we, you compare the effect of PFA and, and RFA in scar border zone, you can see that um, in, in, with RFA, with this specific catheter, you get punctate um, lesions. Um, they have a, a non-transmural um, effect. Uh, with, uh, with the PFA and, the, and, and this larger footprint print catheter, you get wider lesions and deeper lesions. If you um, quantify it, so you can see that the lesions um, are deeper. Um, the, the depth relative to the wall thickness um, is, um, is also greater. The lesion is obviously wider because the footprint is bigger. And overall, the, um, the ability to reach transmorality was, um, was higher with the PFA with this catheter compared to the, R to the RFA. Now, again, you can't really compare um, apples to oranges here, but what you can compare is the effect on the, com on the architecture of tissue. Now, with PFA, when you put the catheter on the surface and you have subendocardial surviving myocardium that is uh, um, marked here with, uh, with the green dotted line, obviously you're going to have an effect on this. Then you have a, a subendocardial fibrosis, and underneath the subendocardial fibrosis, you have mid-myocardial or epicardial um, surviving myocardium. With PFA, um, the electrical field can reach beyond or, or deeper than the layer of collagen to have a non-reversible effect on the deeper layers. Um, it also, like PFA does, it doesn't affect the nerves um, in, the, in the collagen that it, um, that it uh, reached an effect deeper to. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Now, when you compare it to RFA, so RFA have just limited effect on the tissue just under the catheter. It doesn't have an effect on areas that are deeper to, to the collagen. Um, to understand why RFA does it, like why in RFA you don't get a deeper, deeper effect than the, layer, than the separating layer of collagen, we did an ex vivo experiment when in a bath we put healthy um, a septal myocardium and scarred or, or borders on a myocardium. And we had thermocouples um, in the tissue. And here I'm pl I, I, I have plotted the intramyocardial temperature in, which, in each of those setups. So you can see that in the blue, you can reach significantly in the, same, um, in the same distance within the myocardium, you reach higher into myocardial temperature when you don't have scar. But when you have scar, there is a dump in the, uh, in the maximal temperature that you can reach. So the scar acts as an, as an insulator for heat conduction. Um, now, with, with PFA, you don't have it because the effect of uh, pulse field ablation is by applying an electrical field that is irrespective of the, uh, of the material. Um, and, um, and this data has been uh, shown by different groups at Gerstenfeld Group, our group, and um, there was a recent um, a paper showing the same thing. And I think the conclusion from these studies is, is that, that in contrast to RFA, with PFA, we can target viable myocardium that is separated from the catheter by collagen or fat. So this is an advantage. Now, how is this compared to RFA if we now take newer technologies? Let's say we take this, um, uh, the Sphere 9, which has a large footprint. So here you can see the lesion depth with one application of PFA, four application of PFA, obviously deeper lesions. But when you look on RFA, the effect of RFA, this is healthy tissue. So you know, you, you're again not comparing apples to apples, but you get 10 or 11 millimeter depth. 
Now, is it going to be the same in scar tissue? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know. But RFA uh, make really uh, uh, deep lesions with, with a large uh, footprint catheter. Uh, compared to the standard that we use nowadays, which is STSF with um, a mean depth of um, uh, five, six millimeters. So um, from a safety standpoint, there could be some advantages. From an efficacy standpoint, there could be advantage when we are blading in, in SCAR. But there is also potential disadvantages. One is that you have less predictable effect. When you apply PFA, some of it is reversible, some of this is not reversible. The reversibility takes hours. Um, so it's not something that we can um, predict in the lab. Now, non-inducibility or targeting PVCs and so forth, it, it is important to, um, to get as much, uh, as closer as you can to long-term effects. You don't have it with PFA. The other thing with PFA is not a tradable as, as RFA, so you can make more, more applications, but you can't really um, um, change the dosing so much. The other thing, you have loss of EGMs during ablation, uh, which you know, I don't think it's, um, it's, a, it's a great idea, definitely when you are blading in, uh, in VT. And the, lastly, um, PFA, or at least the conduction system, is more sensitive to the electrical field than to the thermal field. So when you're around um, in the conduction system in non-ischemic patients, um, it, you have to be very careful with PFA. So to come to an end here, I will say like, you know, PFA um, is kind of like have been messaged to us as the new king. Maybe, it's not sure. And this is the Gartner uh, hype uh, circle of emerging technologies. And I think, you know, at the beginning we have this hype and that's I think where we were in 2018. I think now the hype is a little bit um, uh, um, tempering down when we see that, you know, it's not as safe and not as effective as we thought. And at some point, it's going to plateau. And if this level um, is going to be higher or lower than RFA, or maybe there's going to be different advantages and disadvantages, it's yet to be um, seen. Um, so to come to answer this question, will PFA change the results of catheter ablation for VT? I, I think if, if I have to guess, I would say likely not. More effective ablation technologies uh, may be helpful. However, these are more influenced by catheter design. So I think large footprint um, electrodes are going to be more important than the type of energy we use. The real challenge uh, for improving the results of VT ablation procedures is understanding these arrhythmias and identifying the optimal target sites, uh, particularly in patients with non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy. And because we are building more destructive uh, tools, we really have to be careful how we use them, um, not to create uh, more, uh, more damage than, um, than help. And I'll end here, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. The next talk I have on the program is Dr. De La Bella. Is that? He's in the lab. Is he going to give it from the lab? Or are we moving to the lab? There we are. <laughs> oh, Paolo, we don't hear you. We see you, but we don't hear you. Rhythm symposium. This afternoon, I will talk about this issue. Can VT ablation improve prognosis? Actually, in the last years, large retrospective studies have suggested the survival benefit of an effective ablation of ventricular tachycardia, but data from randomized pr prospective studies to support these findings were still missing due to issues in study methods that affected feasibility. I think that the most interesting data is stemming from this uh, big database originated from this IVTCC study analyzing data of more than 2,000 patients that had undergone ablation for VT in the setting of structural heart disease. Uh, the slide clearly shows that among these patients, those that did not suffer of VT recurrence following the ablation had a much more favorable follow-up, uh, the endpoint being a mortality and a freedom from cardiac transplant. And you can see on the upper right corner that this is particularly evident in patients with depressed ejection fraction. Now, data from prospective studies in these last years have mostly focused on uh, the concept of prophylactic VT ablation. And uh, most of these studies, although having shown reduced recurrence rate of VT, failed to prove a survival benefit. You see here that uh, we gathered the studies according to the timing of the ablation uh, with respect to the occurrence of VTs. And we have on the left uh, the studies of prophylactic VT ablation. 
uh, early VT ablation following the first uh, ICD shocks and late uh, VT ablation on the right. Today, I will analyze with you uh, the data originated from the uh, recently uh, published studies in years 2022, post SCD, survivity, and partita study. Post SCD uh, trial is unique in uh, its uh, uh, patient population as it gathers the majority of patients with non ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, namely uh, right sided arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It uh, analyzes the follow-up of 120 patients randomized following ICD implantation to catheter ablation of medical therapy. Uh, as you can see here, baseline injection fraction was pretty high in all the groups, so this really making pretty difficult to analyze the presence of any survival benefit. Uh, this study is uh, interesting as uh, it shows the use of advanced mapping techniques, as you see here, multi electrode mapping, uh, detailed analysis of the um, propagation map during sinus rhythm, so uh, profound analysis of the substrate during sinus rhythm. Uh, the endpoint uh, included uh, in non-inducibility of the target VT. Among the weak points, however, we see that remapping, although being encouraged uh, to assess modification, was not really mandatory, and complete non-inducibility was not mandatory in this study. Uh, with that in mind, we see that freedom uh, from uh, VT recurrence, cardiovascular hospitalization, and death was uh, successfully reached in the study as it was significantly lower among these patients that uh, underwent ablation. The major benefit, however, being offered by the prevention of VT recurrence uh, as freedom from uh, further hospitalization and from cardiac death was ac actually non affected by catheter ablation. The second interesting study that I am uh, willing to present to you is the survivability study that also has been published by uh, the uh, Spanish group, first named Dr. Arenal, last year. Is a, a study that is mostly focused on patients that had suffered from a prior infarct. 140 patients were randomized uh, to catheter ablation or anterior drug uh, treatment. Average ejection fraction 40 to 35 percent in this group. And uh, I think that among the features uh, that uh, are included in these studies is that um, VT induction was not required to guide ablation. So it's a subset modification study, mostly guided by imaging, uh, pointing to the elimination of abnormal electrograms. Again, this has been a successful study that showed that patient that underwent ablation reduced the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death, appropriate ICD shocks, hospitalization due to heart failure or severe treatment related complications. Why do I think this is an interesting study? Because it actually does affect prognosis. Although cardiovascular death is seemingly unaffected as it is a, a hospitalization for heart failure, I think that the most interesting finding of these studies is described in the panel D, treatment-related adverse events. Patients that were treated with drugs had an impressive series of recurrent hospitalization due to slow VT that actually required uh, almost uh, invariably uh, ablation. So these were patients that were initially randomized to drug treatment. And it really shows the downside of a uh, anti-treatment treatment based treatment that actually affect prognosis, as you see here, uh, drug interruption or hospitalization for further treatments is extremely more frequent as opposed to patients that uh, had uh, ablation. The third study that I am uh, uh, willing to show you is the PARTITA study that actually is published by our group. Uh, the study was designed to verify the prognostic impact of early VT ablation after the first ICD shocks on the endpoints of mortality and worsening heart failure and also to provide data on natural history of VT following ICD implantation, trying to identify a specific arrhythmia pattern that might predict a subsequent shock. It uh, was a multi-center randomized controlled two-stage study that uh, took more than 10 years to be concluded. Also very important, as you will see, follow-up was uh, daily performed by home monitoring. 
The first stage, we call it phase A, included an uh, evaluation of the written uh, features of the patient from enrollment to the first ICD shock. Patients uh, were included for both primary and secondary prevention in both ischemic, post-infarct, and non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. The uh, aim of the phase A study was to verify whether the burden of non-sustained or ATP-treated sustained VT was predictive of subsequent shock. The second phase, phase B, started from the first appropriate shock, where patients were randomized to a group 1 immediate catheter ablation of the ventricular tachycardia or standard treatment ablation being performed after first episode of electrical storm whenever it occurred. So the study primary endpoints were first appropriate shock delivered for VT, the phase A, and for phase B, a composite of death from any cause or worsening heart failure that led to a subsequent hospitalization. Secondary endpoints, cardiac mortality, recurrence of sustained VT, appropriate shock therapy, and electrical storm. Now, the study was powered to prove advantage in the ablation arm according to the incidence of shock uh, gathered from prior studies that was 20% in five years in the primary prevention group and 53% in two years in the secondary prevention group, leading to a lambda shock instance per month of 0.4 in the primary prevention and 3.1 in the secondary prevention group. But actually what we observed was a much, much lower incidence of shocks. Uh, actually numbers were 0.3% uh, of shock incidents per month in both the primary and the secondary arm. Why that? Possible reasons for lower shock rate were mainly related to ICD programming. And this study was published after the milestone medit rate studies. Uh, so longer detection times and therapy set at higher rates of VTs and drug. A home monitoring uh, allowing a quick, a rapid, up titration of beta blockers whenever an uh, episode of VT had occurred, and amiodarone was substantially banned, so reduced risk of proarrhythmias. As you see here, uh, patients were uh, not treated if their VT rate was lower than 167, so that falls within the uh, monitor rate, and uh, at, uh, the, if the VT was occurring at a rate higher than 167 up to 200, uh, we had a very long detection and redetection counter, approximately leading to a 20 second delay before any ATP was delivered. So really this allowing an extensive evaluation of non-sustained episodes or ATP treated episodes. Uh, as a lower than expected percentage of patient experience uh, VT, we really thought that the study would have been unrealistically prolonged. So the clinical investigation plan was quickly amended to include an adaptive design to a randomized study using a Bayesian approach, and two interim analyses were planned at uh, uh, rates of 25 and 50% of the projected sample size for phase B. Actually, by July 2021, the number of randomized patients required for the first interim analysis completed the study and enrollment, and the analysis showed that the predictive probability of success was high higher than the protocol specific boundary of 99%, so that allowed an immediate claim of study success. That is superiority of immediate ablation over standard treatment. Now, let's see in uh, detail what happened to our patient. Among the 570 patients that were randomized, overall 246 experienced any VT, 47.6%. Of these, 28% being non-sustained to the long detection uh, timing of the ICD programming. Sustained VT being documented in 154, which is about 29.8% of the study population, with 62 patients being treated only with ATP and 56 patients treated with shock and ATP and shocks. Patients that went on to shock were more likely suffered from a prior myofibrillar infarct. And more importantly, uh, we found that among the arrhythmia findings, the number of non-sustained VT episodes were non-prognostic, whereas the number of VT treated and eventually terminated by ATP was actually very important as any ATP run that terminated AVT was associated to a 4% higher rate of subsequent shock. Among the 56 patients that received an appropriate shock for VT, 
Nine were not randomized because either refused randomization, two died, one had first uh, occurrence of electrical storm, and 47 were randomized, 23 contributing to the intention to treat analysis set of the ablation group, and 24 to the ITT analysis set for the standard therapy arm. You see here that patient that went on to ablation was slightly, although not significantly older, 71 versus 65 years, both group had a pretty much depressed ejection fraction, 31 versus 32%. Um, primary prevention, 70-30, uh, ischemic versus non-ischemic, 80-20%. Uh, this slide details the um, requirements of the ablation protocol. High density mapping was strictly enforced to gather both voltage and activation maps, as you see here. VT activation mapping to uh, VT termination was mandated strictly in all patients, as it was remapping that had to show, as you see here, lower uh, left corner, complete abolition of any abnormal activity. Once this uh, endpoint was proven, patient went on to have program stimulation with four extra stimulus, and that had to show the complete non-inducibility of any VT. Now let's go to the results of uh, phase B. The composite endpoint of all cause mortality and worsening heart failure uh, occurred to a significantly lower extent in the ablation arm, 1-4% versus standard therapy arm, 10 patients, that is 41%. There was no mortality in the uh, patient treated with ablation, 8 versus 8% 8 in the standard therapy. Worsening heart failure and cardiac mortality sixfold higher in the patient treated with standard therapy as opposed to ablation. Among the secondary endpoints, recurrent VT was shock, 8% in the ablation arm, 41% in the standard therapy arm. The slide here shows the kaplan mayer analysis of the primary endpoint, both in the intention to treat analysis panel A and the PER protocol that really in panel B that really shows how uh, important is the um, difference in the uh, outcome of the primary endpoint between the ablation and the uh, conservative standard therapy arm. Also, you see here, panel C, that there was no mortality in the ablation arm and the worsening uh, heart failure hospitalization contributing also to a minor extent to the uh, endpoint uh, of the study. Among the secondary endpoints, I think it is very important to point out the difference in recurrence of ventricular tachycardia treated with shock between the group. And that is very important because that leads to Partita being the first trial to really confirm the link between decreasing arrhythmia recurrence and enhanced survival. It is very nice to show the similarity of the two survival course of the retrospective IVTT study on the left where patients that had no recurrence following VT ablation had a significantly lower incidence of mortality and uh, requirement of transplant panel on the left. And uh, on the right, uh, the overall event-free survival, again, uh, I remind you, overall um, mortality and uh, uh, worsening heart failure mortality among patients that were treated by ablation, uh, red line versus those that treated by standard therapy. So uh, we see that uh, despite the limited sample size, the Partita trial indicated a significant superiority of VT ablation after the first episode of VT treated with shock over a standard approach in terms of both mortality and hospitalization to worsening heart failure. The composite endpoint of that and worsening heart failure was 4% in the ablation group versus 41% in control group with a relative risk reduction of 89%. Also, catheter ablation was associated with lower recurrence of VTs treated by shock and with a lower mortality. So overall, this finding support for considering ablation in patients with ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, both in primary and secondary prevention indication for ICD after the first appropriate shock. Among the relevant observations uh, stemming from the study, also we observed a lower than expected rate of VT treated with shock. Now in the years 2020, uh, approximately 10% at three years in both primary and secondary prevention, much lower than historical data stemming from studies published in the years 2000. And that was probably related to multiple reasons. Study core characteristics, prompt upgrade of beta blockers during remote monitoring, 
uh, avoidance of amiodarone treatment and modern ICD programming in the anti tachycardia pacing efficacy. Also, considering ATP, any ATP leading to redetermination was found to be a strong predictor of subsequent ICD shock. Actually, any successful delivered ATP increased the risk for subsequent shock by 4%. Now, my fi final slide. Does ablation of VT affect prognosis? Yes. I think that these three last studies that have been published last year uh, are altogether pointing in the same direction. There is a strong uh, benefit in the primary endpoint that includes death, heart failure, treatment-related complication, avoidance of uh, hospitalizations stemming from these three studies, and that for me constitutes a strong for a strong call for immediate treatment of ventricular tachycardia, kind of early in the natural history of the patient following acid implantation. Thank you for your attention. We will now move to uh, the discussion questions for uh, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Anter, and uh, Dr. De La Bella. All right, do we have all of our Panelists Fine. available for a question. We see Dr. De La Bella. Well, but still, here. Yeah, the, the one was. Questions. Oh, we need to. Oh. Paolo, are you available hey. for questions? Yeah. We see you, but we don't hear you. Hello, this is EP Lab. I can. Hello. Hello. Ah, very good. <laughs> okay. So, qu questions for Dr. Garcia and Dr. Uh, Anter. Try again once, please. One more. One last round, please. Okay. Very good. So, so Furman, yeah. let me ask you. Um, you know, you showed that uh, the endocardial activation timing can be very misleading for these LV outflow okay. tract um, arrhythmias. But is there a downside to going to just the earliest endocardial site and giving an RF application there first before you do all of the other mapping? What has led you to your present approach? Yeah, I think that uh, that's a very good point, uh, Bill. I think that retrospectively, if you think about it, if you don't find anything early after mapping everywhere, um, and then, uh, you go to the earliest endocardial site, even though it could even be post-QRS. That would be the findings of the true intramural uh, success PVCs that we did when it was really early. So I think that the first thing you do is you rule out an epicardial um, LV summit, defined LV summit origin, because it's not minus 40 in the AAV. And then you don't have anything really early uh, anywhere else um, if you could not get. And that strategy could help even if you're prepared to do venous mapping. Sometimes there's no veins. Sometimes you do a good venogram and you don't find any veins that you can put a wire or anything. So that would be a strategy um, that you can, you can approach and try to do a lesion from the LV endo to see if you have any effect. So, Absolutely, you could do a relatively earliest breakthrough in the end, or even if it's late, and go there um, uh, to to give it a shot, quote unquote. Thank you. I, I like to see it early first because then I know that what I'm doing, even though it doesn't make sense because it's late, it's going to work because you're so close. So I like to prove the concept that's early in the intramural space. But if you can't for any reason, uh, that would be that would be a strategy, and you would know because if it's if you're close enough, it's going to work. Uh, it's going to work within the first few seconds of RF application. If it takes you a minute to suppress the PVC, then you know you're very far away, and that that might not get you anywhere. Speaking, I have a question for uh, Professor Anter, if it's possible. May you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, of course, I know that we are in another field, but just talking about uh, 
PFA. What do you think about the recent report about the complication in t with the interparenchymal hemorrhage in the lung? So, considering the safety, okay? and consider the, the neighbor, so the, the structure that are just close to the heart. What do you think about it? What you can say about it? About the lungs in specifically or about the safety profile of PFA in general? Because I agree with your conclusion. So I think that we are just uh, in the beginning, uh, in, in an early phase of experience with this uh, new energy. Yeah. Um. You know, again, as, as I mentioned before, when PFA um, was uh, first reported clinically um, by, um, by uh, intravenous catheters or percutaneous procedures, the safety profile seems, um, seems too good to be true, but seems very, very um, promising. I think for atrial fibrillation ablation, there is no doubt, there is already, as um, uh, Joseph showed before, there is um, over 10,000 cases, there is no esophageal injury, it's safe for atrial fibrillation in the sense of uh, protecting the esophagus, which is the you know, worst complication. And it looks like also phrenic nerve, it does not cause any permanent damage, it can cause some transient effect. So we started from no effect on the phrenic nerve, now potentially there is an effect, but it's transient. The coronary arteries, we know there could be an issue. The lungs, we know there could be an issue. Um, is it first? Is it like the result of first iteration technologies, or is it really the um, the energy itself? Um, yet, you know, yet to be um, to be discovered. I, I I don't know. I really don't know what's the um, what's the answer to what you you're asking. I think we need more experience, particularly like for for VT. Is it really an appealing technology versus, um, you know, RFA? I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, should we move to the cases? Are you guys ready to? Uh... Um, we're, go we're going to be ready soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it looks like Dr. De La Bella may be ready. Okay. Should we move to the case, or should we do more questions?